Good morning. Can I welcome members of the press and public to the 18th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015. Uh, can I first of all ask all those present to ensure that the electronic items are switched to flight mode uh, so that they do not affect the work of the committee? Uh, first, advise colleagues that the have been apologies have been received from Colin Keir. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sandra White, who is standing in for uh, uh, Colin Keir. Uh, can I move to agenda item number one? Uh, which is the decision in taking business in private. The question is that we take agenda item number three in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Colleagues, we'll now move to agenda item number two, uh, which is oral evidence on the AGS report entitled 2013-14, Audit of Coatbridge College, Governance of Severance Arrangements. Uh, I welcome this morning the first panel of witnesses, uh, Derek, Derek Banks, who is the former Director of Finance uh, of Coatbridge College, uh, and Lorraine Gunn, the former uh, Director of HR and Board Secretary to Coatbridge College. Uh, as we are tight for time today, uh, we'll move straight to questions, although I understand there are no opening statements from uh, Mr Banks or Lorraine Gunn. So firstly, uh, Mr Banks, uh, can I welcome you to the committee? Uh, can I first of all ask you just to confirm over what period that you were the Director of Finance for Coatbridge College? Uh, from the 1st of August 2006 until the 31st of March 2014. In that period, it was your responsibility in the role of the Director of Finance, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And particularly during the period that the Auditor the General refers to, you were the Director of Finance uh, during that period? I was. Were you responsible for the financial arrangements surrounding the severance agreements that were reached? Um, were you ultimately responsible for ensuring that these arrangements were signed off financially? In terms of agreeing the funds were available, yes. Yeah. So particularly in relation to uh, the severance arrangements for John Doyle, the former principal, uh, you are personally responsible for the financial arrangements around that? Can you clarify what you mean by personally responsible? Um, Obviously your, your role, or for, maybe you want to explain what your role as the Director of Finance would have been uh, when such a severance arrangement was put before you uh, on behalf of the Board. It was only to ensure that the funds were available for that payment to be made. Okay, so you don't have any responsibilities for uh, ensuring that the external and internal auditors uh, were, were made aware of the arrangements that were being reached in respect of Mr Doyle? No, um, that, that would be the responsibility of the Audit Committee to inform them. If, if you look at the guidance uh, that the Funding Council did issue in 2000, it clearly states that the Accountable Officer is, is uh, charged with informing the uh, auditors of that approach. Uh, that would normally be done through the Audit Committee. Right. So, when the Audit Committee reports to you, or whoever reports to you and advises you that a sum of £304,000 has to be paid into an employee's uh, bank account, and someone who will be very shortly a former employee, did it never occur to you that you should at least contact the internal and the external auditors? Is that not something that you as an experienced Director of Finance would have considered? We did discuss this with um, Mr uh, Keenan, the Chair of the Audit Committee, about their approach to bringing in internal and external audit. At the time, um, you have to bear in mind that obviously the, the college was merging then it wasn't. And up until the um, 7th of October 2014, um, we were, the college did not believe it had any liability for any severance payments because the decisions that were made by the committee uh, back on 28th of January 2013 um, were nullified by Cobras College withdrawing from the merger on the 25th of February. So there was no liability up until the 7th of October, whereby um, the Merger Management Committee met and discussed the severance arrangements that were brought up through due, due diligence. At that point, I did discuss with Mr Keenan about the approach we should take, um, and that, by that point, um, Mr Doyle and Mr uh, Gray had already agreed to bring in Bigot Bailey to fulfil that role of internal audit particularly because of their experience in HR and legal issues. So you were aware of the guidance that was, that, that's available yes. uh, from 2000 and the SFC, and quite clearly, I mean, let's forget about the arrangements of the audit committee. You, you're the person ultimately responsible for signing a cheque to ensure that this money is provided. This money wouldn't that, have been... That's not correct. What is your role as Director of Finance then? I'm not responsible for authorising that payment. That, so, that payment, because it was in excess of £250,000, the scheme of delegation means it has to be signed off by the board. So, so it's been signed off by the board. So what, what's your role then after that's been agreed by the board? Do you, are, you, are you the Director of Finance, but you can't say, well, look, I think you should refer this to the internal and external auditor? 
No, I, I did obviously um, query the payment with Mr Keenan. So why did you query the payment? Because of the attendance of Mr Lawrence Hills at the uh, 23rd of October board meeting. Yeah. I did, after that meeting, I asked Mr Keenan, should I stop that payment? Because I was aware that payment would be made on the 25th of October. I was told, because the committee had agreed that payment, not to stop it. So, you, so on the basis of that Mr Keenan was the... Uh, acting, or is it? It was, this. It was the newly elected chair of the board, although that would only be effective from the 1st of November. So, anybody who, so, so the board take any decisions, are you, are you tell me that you're not in a position as director of finance to at least say, look, I think this should be referred to the external and internal auditors. I mean, you're, you're a man of significant experience. I can see that from your uh, <coughs> biography. You've been, you know, you've been at the college for all those years. Did you not, somebody with the integrity that you should have had as Director of Finance, said, yeah, I'm really sorry about this, Mr Keenan, but you've asked me to make this payment, but this is a significant sum. The guidance says that the external and internal auditors need to be made aware of this. Regardless of the audit arrangements within the College, I want to refer this to the internal and external auditors, because you advised the external auditor, or the internal auditors some weeks later, didn't you, in an informal conversation? Yeah. So it must have been troubling you during that period. Well, in, in terms of the guidance, um, paragraph 36 uh, details the, the requirements of external audit, and it recognises that normally um, they, they would pick up a post-event yeah. organisation. So, so let's stick to internal so audit. Uh, external audit's fine. Uh, internal audit, um, it, th there is an issue with that. And it, it is clear that internal audit should actually carry out an audit needs assessment uh, when they found out that the college was going through merger. Now, it's interesting that, that for New College Lancashire um, in, in the role from January 2014, but didn't pick that up uh, for Coatbridge College when they were both uh, internal auditors for Coatbridge and Cumbernauld College at the time. But, but, but let's stick to the point here. You, you're the Director of Finance. I mean, what, what, just to clarify for the record, what's your annual salary? If, at Coatbridge College at the time? Yeah. Um, I think it was when I left, it was £82,000. Yeah. So it's a significant salary. You have significant responsibilities. You're, you're not just there to just make payments without at least questioning them. I mean, did you never ever question payments that were put forward to you before? But I think I've already demonstrated that I did question whether that payment should be made or not. So, but why did you question it? Because all, all you've said is Lawrence Hills attended the meeting. Well, he's attended other meetings before. So yeah. what was the specific... So that was, was your concern that the external and internal audit, or the, ex, or the internal auditors weren't aware of this? Is that your concern? So what it, was it, your concern? Not just that Mr Hills attended yeah. the meeting, because I'm sure he's attended other meetings yeah. that, that didn't stop you from making payments, so... What was the specific reason? No, the feedback, obviously, we, we weren't at the initial remuneration committee meeting um, and we only attended the board meeting after Mr uh, Hills had left. But Mr Keenan did feedback to us uh, about what was uh, the Mr Hills' concerns. Um, and and at what, that point, what, were the, what were those feedback? What was the feedback? Well, specifically point? that um, any agreement above the 13 months um, would have to have a justification for doing that. And what that was the justification then? What, you'd have to ask the Reunion Committee for, for that because I wasn't involved in that, making that decision. Right, so, so you, you're the Director of Finance and you just decide to make... I mean, wh I mean why, why do you just have a Director of Finance just to make payments? Is that, is that all you do? No. Is I mean, that, what was your role within the organisation? Did you not have to make them aware of the finances that were available to the College? Because I understand the College was... Well, there were significant challenges facing the College financially. Did you not make them aware of that as well? Not, not in the financial year 2012-13. Uh, we actually made a, a surplus in that year. Um, so for, for anything before that, it, it would have been fine to make those payments. But I did challenge the, the, the payment, and I did ask whether it should be made or not. Right, so you did challenge, but you're still not told us what the basis of that is, though, have you? Well, the concerns raised by Mr Hills was what, the basis of that. And what was the concerns that you were aware that Mr Hills had raised? Around the, the, the amount the, that was to be paid. The, over the 13 months. Yeah, and yeah. Um, obviously the concerns that there, there wasn't a business case for that. And did you, during that period, and this is the last couple of questions for me, did you, during that period, uh, was there any exchanges with anybody, either verbally or via email, where somebody says, look, maybe this should go to the external and internal auditors. Maybe we should have a discussion about that. Do you, do you recall any emails during up and running to that period? Uh, nothing specifically about bringing an internal and external audit in. No, but never... Do you look back at now and not say, well, maybe I should have called the external the internal with, with hindsight, it's, it's always a great thing, but I think, and I haven't discussed it with the chair of the audit committee, Tom Keane at the time, that bringing in Bigger Bailey was more effective than bringing an internal audit at that point in time. So I, I put it to you then. It's £304,000 yes. been paid into somebody's bank account. It's a significant sum of public money yes. that's been paid into that account. You're the director of finance. You must have known somewhere <laughs> along the line somebody would say, well, 
<coughs> Derek, why did you pay? Why did you make that payment? What's the justification for that? <coughs> and clearly, th this issue has now been questioned by the Auditor General. Do you not feel some sense of responsibility that maybe you should have probed this to some greater extent? Well, I, th I think it, I probed as far as I could do. Um, obviously, the Rules Committee made that decision in terms of the award to Mr. Doyle and the timing of that award. Um, I did question it, and we did go through a process with Bigger Bailey to identify that we did follow guidance and that uh, the Rules Committee had all the information that they required to make that decision. So it wasn't my decision to make that payment. Yeah, I understand that, but you still when you get back to the issue about external and internal auditors. It's very clear in the guidance, regardless of what committees it's been referred to. I would have seen it, and we do not accept that it's your responsibility, Director Finance, to do that. That's no. why you're paid £83,000 a year to at least say, listen, there's an issue about this payment, Tom. We need to we need to look at this. But external, internal auditors, who I'm in, were you in constant contact with? with how often would you be in contact with internal? It, it would depend on the audit program that was in place. Um, obviously, I was the main liaison with internal audit in terms of their, their work program that was set so, by the, the so, audit committee. So, just to confirm, and finally, from September, let's say the period from September to October, there'd have been quite a lot of discussion taking place about these severance arrangements, wouldn't there? Particularly in October. Yeah. Through, through the board, it would be yes. Yeah. So, did you have any discussions with the internal auditor during that period? Uh, well, the only time I had a specific con conversation about it was the 28th of October with them. So, you never, you never at any stage during those two months said, why don't I have a chat with the internal auditor and tell them that there's going to be significant sums of money being paid out of the, the college bank account? I need to have a chat with these, these, this auditor to make sure that whatever payment I'm making is going to be accepted by the, or they're at least not going to have any issues with, particularly yeah. the external auditor who would have to sign off the accounts. Yeah, but again, the, the paragraph 36 of the guidance says that generally the external audit would be performed after the event. I understand that, but you, but, you still, but, but you still have to go, you, you still need to put together a set of accounts, make payments to people, and satisfy these individuals, both internal and external auditors. Now, you'll know that better than me. You're the one that's qualified to do this, I'm yeah. not. But here's the issue. Should you not have done that? Have you not at least had a conversation? Did you, I mean, during that whole year, did you have conversations with the auditors? Uh, in general, yes, there would be conversations. So why, they so, the, so why the have business? general conversations with them about other issues? But then this comes up to a really important financial transaction that's taking place at the college, and you, you, don't, you don't want to make contact with the auditors? Well, it's, it's not incredible. that we didn't want to make contact with them. We didn't think that it was required because we brought in Bigger Bailey to do that assessment for us. Oh, so Bigger Bailey are to blame now. So we've got them coming on next. So, I, so I'm not blaming anyone, but, they're, but, but they're they carried out an assessment Bigger for Bailey's us. Not, well, to be fair, Bigger Bailey are not the directors of finance, you are. No, no. Uh, and they, I, don't, I take it that they're not responsible for appointing external or, or at least having liaison with external and internal auditors, are they? No, no, they wouldn't be. But they yeah. gave us the, the advice that, that the Rooney Scheme Committee asked for in terms of whether they can make that payment or not. Yeah, so, but just to clarify here, because we have Bigger Billy coming next, mm -hmm. at no time did Bigger Billy say to you, you don't have to make contact with the external and internal auditors, did I, they? I can't remember them saying that. No. So why would it be relevant to bring them into the conversation then? Because they, they, were, they were in actually replacing internal audit in that process, because they had particular expertise in HR and legal issues that would actually... So, sorry, just to clarify here, you're saying that they were replacing internal audit? Yes. Is that, so is that, is that the basis by which Bigger and Bailey were appointed? As far as no, yes. So, so there will be paperwork to clarify that Bigger and Bailey were appointed and they effectively took over the role of internal audit? Yeah. Well, that, that's not what the auditors advised us when they met with us uh, last week. They didn't advise us, or the week before, they didn't advise us that they, they were replaced by Bigger and Bailey. And, and we had that discussion with them on the 28th of October. Um, where we outlined our processes, what we were planning to do, and they did not disagree with those processes. Okay. Mary Scanlon. Uh, just before uh, coming to Lorna Gunn, can I just ask, um, uh, am I right in saying that uh, when they were looking for uh, their generous payments, when you were agreeing to the generous payments, as the Director of Finance, uh, did you confirm to the principal uh, and others that the College could well afford the 400000 above? Uh, what the SFC would pay? Um, uh, not at that particular time. Uh, th again, the process that we went through uh, started in January 2013, yeah. where, where the Rooney agreed. But there was a shortfall. There, there would was have a been, shortfall. Yes. It was 1.7 million was paid out. The SFC paid 1.3 million. Yes. The college had to pay 400,000. Did you okay that 400,000? 
I would raise my concerns about it, but ultimately it wasn't my decision but to do But ultimately it. you did, you, as the Director of Finance for Coatbridge College, you agreed to that payment of 400,000. I would have told them the risks at the time, but then you ultimately it was that, their, I, I didn't. Would, I would have told them the risks at the time, a potential risk of not being able to meet that. You told um, them the risks of what? Of the potential not having the funds to do that. I'm not hearing what you're saying properly. <laughs> Sorry, just different accents. I'm from the Highlands. Right. Could you speak a bit? Yeah. Right. You told them the potential risks of paying out an extra 400,000 yeah, more that, than the SFT guidance. Yeah, that's that's nowhere in our evidence. Mm -hmm. Our evidence is telling us that you agreed to that extra 400,000. Don't you worry. The SFC will pay 1.3 million. I can find 400,000 in the college funds for the 400,000 shortfall. Is that right? No, no. I communicated with Nicholas right. Latcher about this issue and the Funding Council. Um, there was a standard template that had to be completed for a business case. Uh, all the figures were on there. Uh, I informed both New College Latcher and the Funding Council about the shortfall. You informed them. I think you need to be clear about this. When did you inform them? Did you agree to this 400,000 being paid? Because our evidence says that you did. It had been March of 2014, they were told. But you, you signed off that cheque for the, the... I mean, they were talking about the additional money long before March 2014. Well, um, in terms of the only, the only one that went before the 1st October was Mr Doyle. After that, um, it was a, a process of most people leaving on the 31st of March 2014. But you knew that happening. on vesting day, Coatbridge College had a deficit of over a million pounds... The 400,000 additional, very generous severance payments contributed to 40% of that deficit. You were fully aware of that, but the advice that you gave was that, yeah, it's okay, we can, we can find that. No, at the time of leaving the college, I, I was predicting a, a small surplus of £34,000 up until the 31st of March, including those payments. And when did you leave the college? 31st of March. 31st of March. And yes, when did you but I did start, ask to stay on. When did you start your new job in SQA? Uh, it was seven weeks later. Seven weeks later. Yes. OK. So I'm quite surprised. We've got, um, as a director of finance, your severance due under the new college Lanarkshire scheme was nine months, but you were paid 13. Mm -hmm. And you got a job seven weeks later, but your payment in lieu of notice was £20,600. And another five and a half thousand accrued, accrued annual leave. Not bad money for seven weeks unemployed, is it? Um, I started with SQE as a consultant, so it wasn't as a, a permanent employee, and I'm still not a permanent employee of SQE either. I've got a, a temporary contract with them. Um, in terms of my severance arrangements, uh, I was on a retainer to give advice and help to New College Latcher, which I did up until May this year. So why would you pay uh, four months more than what you uh, four months more severance pay than what you were due compared to all the other uh, payments? Because why were um, you given more generous payments? Because New College Lancer wished me to be on a retainer to give them advice and help when they required it. Mm, right. I'll move to um, uh, Lorraine Gunn, if I may. Lorraine, the 28th of January remuneration committee is very critical. It's actually the heart of the Auditor General's report, um, which states the chair and the principal didn't provide the remuneration committee with advice provided by the SFC, no evidence that they were provided with a detailed business case. We still haven't found a business case from either of you. And uh, the terms being discussed at the Remuneration Committee were not in line with the advice of the Scottish Funding Council. These are all quotes from the Auditor General. Now, uh, I understand it was your responsibility as the HR Director to provide the committee with that advice and information. Is that correct? Um, and what I provided in advance of the committee um, was in response to um, questions from the, the chair of the board. He wanted to know from me um, what was available within the sector in terms of known um, severance arrangements. Um, the purpose of the meeting, um, when I was told to call the meeting as the clerk to the board, was very specifically um, to address arrangements for senior staff. Not at that point in time necessarily about payments, but he, he wanted to discuss with the committee, um, you know, just 
generally where we all were at and you know in terms of worries about the merger etc but I, I was aware that severance was going to come up as part of those but discussions. But I think there's nothing general about the specific discussions about 21 months for John Doyle, three months for taking him through the merger, six months plus a 90,000 pension contribution. They did get into That's hardly a general discussion. That is very specific what I'm about saying, Mr Doyle. Well, if you'll let me explain, you know, when I, you know, when I was first asked to give advice, it was a broad overview of what was available. I believe it was the remuneration committee's responsibility to discuss that in some detail to either form a, a way forward or to come to an informed decision about what they wanted to do. All I was doing was giving information. In that broad overview yes. of what was available, did you give them the Scottish Funding Council advice, which you had sought uh, and found uh, on the Scottish Funding Council website? Did you give that advice to each and every member of the Remuneration Committee in order that they make the right decision, I believe informed I, decision? I believe I did do that in two ways. Um, I believe that um, initially I spoke to the chair and gave guidance and counsel to the chair of the board to engage in advance of that remuneration committee with Mark Batho, the then chief executive of the funding council, um, about that severance guidance and was very specific with him in terms of drawing his attention to the existence of the guidance, which I was aware of historically that the guidance existed. Um, he asked me to get him a copy of said guidance beforehand. When I went to the SFC website, I couldn't find anything other than what we now know to be the 2000 document, <coughs> which happened to be within the archive part of the site. So in getting him to speak to Mark Batho of the Funding Council, I counselled that he needed to check that we were operating off the most correct version. Subsequent to that, they did call me in partway through, I think it was about 20 minutes into remuneration committee. Um, John, John Gray, the, the chair of the board, explained that the purpose for me being there was to be able to share with them the information that he'd asked me to get in advance, which I did. Um, and I've made available to you a statement where I've, you know, um, which I is read your today. statement, uh, but you still haven't answered my point. You well, gave the advice, if you just let me finish, if you, you gave the advice to the chair. We've already had the chair sitting in the chair that uh, you're in. We've also had the remuneration committee. The remuneration committee did not see that advice. So when you were talking to the chair, did you raise the issue with the chair that the SFC guidance on voluntary servant, severance was 12 months voluntary pay for 14 years, it wasn't as, as opposed to what the remuneration committee were discussing, 21 months plus three plus six. No, Did you point out that what they were discussing in terms of the generous terms for Mr Doyle were way above what the SFC guidance recommended? No, I didn't explain so it in that context. What I did was I made the, the guidance available. Um, there was definitely a conversation at that remuneration committee when I came into the room where the chair of the board discussed the conversation that he'd had with Mark Batho and talked about the guidance that was available. Um, and subsequent to that, I did make that guidance available. Um, to so are you, did you give paper copies to each and every member of the remuneration committee and say this is the SFC guidance? No, because they, they didn't have any information. I'm struggling to see. You, you had a chat with John Gray, the chair, who then phoned Mark Batho. But what did the remuneration committee who made that decision, what advice, written or otherwise, regarding the Scottish Funding Council guidance, what, how did you furnish them with that information? At Coatbridge College, we did not print off board papers and information in hard copy. We put all the information for board members on their board intranet. And that is how I made that information available to them. It so was you didn't accessible. give them information. You left it to them to go and, you know, flurry around the but internet. They were aware it was there. They were guided to that information. At the meeting. Did you tell them that the Scottish Funding Council guidance on voluntary severance was much less, considerably less, 
less than half of what they were discussing mm. for John Doyle. No. Did you not, as HR director, point out that they were making an agreement that has ended up in us all being here, including yourself, as Human Resources Director, did you not point out that the voluntary severance guidance from the Scottish Funding Council was considerably less than what they were being asked to agree to by John Gray? I didn't specifically point that out, but I do believe I gave them the information. You gave by them the advice of, to look at the internet when they had... The, Time. No, I would refute that because at the end of the day, the discussion did take place did at the, the committee. Did the, the discussion that information? Me, Sorry. Did the discussion? It's very important that we know. John Gray was aware of the Scottish Funding Council guidance. You were aware of the Scottish Funding Council guidance. 14 years, you got 12 months' pay. Mm -hmm. The remuneration committee who made the decision about the 30 months pay for John Doyle, were not aware of the Scottish Funding Council guidance. I'm trying to find out where is this information going. And what I'm trying to clarify for you both as HR direct, the then HR Director and Clerk to the Board is that I believe the Remuneration Committee were made aware of it. I wasn't made aware of it. I mean, John Look, Doyle said they could go and look at the internet. Is that the, making aware? The discussion took place at the committee, and John spoke about the advice that he got from Mark Batho of the Funding Council. So the advice from Mark Batho was you can pay what the Scottish Funding Council recommend, and anything further than that, you, the college can pay for it itself. I can't recall the specifics, because it, it was well, two years ago, but evidence. it is in his email that he did subsequently send to the chair of the board. Right. But this, the remuneration committee, who have all sat here in good faith, they but, did not receive that information. But likewise, we're sitting here in good faith and saying exactly the same thing. We, I'm, I'm giving you the facts as I know them to be. But many. you're saying what John Doyle said, the information was there if they wanted to go and look at the internet. You did not give them a it piece of paper to say this is the basic guidance, with but respect, you can go over and the college has to pay the, the with additional respect, amount. It wasn't as dismissive as that, I would put it to you. I, we were very, very specific um, well, me in terms of giving the advice to the chair that that information was available. I think the chair did fulfil his role in having that discussion with remuneration committee, and I don't accept what my remuneration committee colleagues okay. have said in not having that information. So the Auditor General obviously got it wrong. The Auditor General for Scotland has obviously got it wrong when she states that uh, uh, the did not provide the remuneration committee with complete or accurate information. It is not for so, me to conclude me, that. Stump, yeah. I, I, I'm Sorry, quoting from the report, the chair and the principal did not provide the college's remuneration committee with advice provided by the SFC. I so you're saying that you did provide that, but what yes. I'm hearing from you is... You were providing an arrow and saying, if you want it, go and look at the internet. You did not give them a copy or a verbal update on what the SFC guidance spelt out. They were given a copy, and I think it's you know, and I think that is that is not as what important. they said. They were given a copy of the SFC guidance, which said that for 14 years service you could get 12 months pay. So they all sat there and ignored that, and when they came here. They basically told us mistruths, that they hadn't seen it, and they disregarded that, and instead of 12 months, they gave Mr Doyle 30 months. That's what you're saying. I'm sure they've got a different story to tell. I that wasn't what they said last time. All I can do is give you the information and facts as I know them to be. Well, I'm sure we'll hear from them. So just my final point, convener. Um, you are probably the only person, Miss Gunn, that had access to John Doyle's contract of employment. Was the 30 months pay, which was hugely generous at a time of uh, public sector freeze, was that in line with his uh, contract of employment? Was he entitled to 30 months, more than twice what the Scottish Funding Council recommended? I believe that any payments that were made to him were in accordance with his contractual arrangements. So his contract of employment, well, I need to know a bit more of that. This is a, a legal point. Well, don't we don't have... have access to that. Did his contract of employment stipulate 
that he was entitled to far more than was recommended by the Scottish Funding Council. Far more in terms of what? I've spelt it out about six times already. I'm, I'm sorry, but, 14 you know, years for 12 months, and he got 30 months. Plus, you were all, you were willing to give him an extra 90,000 his pension, etc. Sorry, forgive me. His arrangement was in accordance with the arrangement that he was offered by the remuneration committee. No, was it in accordance with his contract of employment? There was nothing in his contract of employment about a severance arrangement. But what is in his contract? Uh, was the clause about payment in lieu of notice, which you may be referring to. And, and, sorry, I did say my final point, but uh, just when you came to looking at the 2% increase um, in pay for the ordinary members of staff at Coatbridge College, um, you did say that uh, uh, the chair said if the college acted in any other way, than giving a 2% increase, that we would look to being flagrant with funds before the merger, heaven forfend. So, you know, you were quite happy to agree to a 2% increase in salary for everyone else in the college, because anything above 2% would have been flagrant with the funds, is the word that's used. So why was it 2% for everyone else? And huge amounts. I think you would, you would have to severance. ask the remuneration committee that question, Mary. That's not for me to answer that question. But you're here. It, it's it, it's all about Lorna Gunn. Uh, I'm Lorraine reading, Gunn, forgive reading me. Reading the report here for the extraordinary board of management held on the 6th of August, attending Lorna Gunn. And Lorraine Gunn. Lorraine, uh, Lorraine Gunn. Sorry. And uh, you know, this is advice that you you'd been given. Sorry, can you repeat the question for me? Yes, the question was, why was it OK? You were worried about giving other members of staff 2%, in case you might be seen as being flagrant, is the word, with funds before the merger. So why was there a different approach to all other members of staff at the college? I don't recall in my statement writing anything where I've indicated that I was worried about anything. Which, that's why I'm looking rather puzzled at this moment so in time. So if you can just clarify sorry, exactly what you mean by that It's the minutes of the meeting, question. and the chair did say that. Oh, sorry, just, just, sorry did, I just need so, a bit of clarity. Yeah, just, just to recap, so if Ms Scanlon can confirm the actual date and the actual minutes that she Yes, it was, the, it was the minutes of the meeting uh, the extraordinary board of management meeting on the 6th of August. I just find the language quite concerning, given the very over generous payments that were agreed in January and throughout the year. And uh, you were a bit worried about giving 2% to all the other members of staff. And you were there at the meeting. And I would hope that as the director of fine. Uh, uh, human resources, you would be advising the chair on his comments here. Well, forgive me, but I, I don't recall that specifically. You know, I can't say any more. Area uh, at the meeting of the remuneration committee on the in January 2013. When you were present at that meeting, was the Scottish Funding Council's specific guidance? that the, you should only pay, the college should only pay one year's salary enhancement. Was that specifically discussed by all those present? Yes. And who introduced the, that? The chair of the board introduced it. He said he'd had a conversation with Mark Batho of the Funding Council, and he explained in that meeting the advice that he got. And what did the other member, to the best of your recollection, what did the other members of the remuneration committee say in response to that? Guidance. I think there was more discussion, if I'm being entirely honest, at the meeting about the fact that the Funding Council's guidance um, seemed to be lost within... Uh, it wasn't available on their main website. It was tucked away in their archive site, and there wasn't actually current guidance available at all at the Funding Council when we first went. But Mark Batho, as you've just said... So, to but Mark Batho subsequently did clarify that. I well, then subsequently, that. we're talking about the meeting. This was to, prior to the meeting, Mark Batho had spoken to your chairman, and he had made it abundant... Well, we're led to believe he'd made it abundantly clear that the, the SFC, funding, uh, SFC guidance was that it should only be one year's salary enhancement. Is that correct? And that was made absolutely crystal clear to the remuneration committee? The, the, there was a discussion, yes, um, that the chair had where he did explain 
the advice that Mark um, had given to him. And then who introduced all these red herrings about what was on a website and what wasn't a website? Was that the chairman as well who talked about all that stuff? I can't recall. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Banks, can I ask you, um, I was just trying to clarify um, some of the things, some of the evidence you laid before the convener earlier on. First of all, on the business plan, um, you're obviously aware that the guidance said there should be a business plan in relation to a severance payment. Yes. The business yes. case, sorry, yes. my apologies, the business case. And that never happened. Um, as far as we're aware, it did go to the remuneration committee on the 28th of January. No, no, there's no Dorn. evidence that we have seen at all that was a business case. That was my understanding, that it went to that meeting. Who told you that? That would have been the chair of the, the board at the time. So, quite specifically, he told you there had been a business case for the seven spins. Did you ever see it? No. So, how would you, would you have had to have satisfied yourself that, that it existed? Not necessarily. I mean, there's never been an issue with governance in the past within the college. No, sure. So um, I would not have expected to see that, particularly for a remuneration committee, where, where I have never seen any of the minutes no, arising indeed. from it. But it wouldn't be part of your director of finance's functions to see that business case justification for a £300,000 payout? No. No. And in terms of the auditor that the convener was asking about, in your understanding of the, audit, the internal audit process, that auditor should have seen that business case? Uh, ordinarily, um, th they would be involved in that discussion, yeah. but th it's not to authorise the payment in any way. It's actually to make sure the processes were Absolutely. followed and guidance was followed. Absolutely. That's all it is. Absolutely. And it didn't happen. To the, uh, as you now know, it didn't happen. Well, obviously, we discussed that on the 28th of October with a uh, two part well, partner and a, a senior manager of Wiley & Bissett yeah. to outline the process of bringing in Bigot Bailey, which they were satisfied would uh, meet that requirement. So let's be clear, you were misled by... By whom? Someone told you there'd been a business case, and you were that, as we know, wasn't didn't happen. I would have no doubt, given the, the experience I've had at Cobridge College, that, that if I'd been told, it, I'd expected that to be present. Yeah, but but again, you were misled. Someone t you said earlier, just a moment ago, that you were told that business case had been carried out. Yeah. All, all I can say, I would expect that to, to have happened. Right. Okay. Um, earlier on, you said that um, the the. You'll just have to clarify what you meant by this. You said that there was no liability for severance payments to the convener. What did you mean by that? Yeah. It, the decisions that were made on the 28th of January by the remuneration committee yes. uh, effectively nullified when Corbridge College withdrew from the merger on the 25th of February. So there'd be no liability, there was no merger, so therefore no liability at that point in time. Only um, after the merger management group meeting on the 7th of October, where the, the, the legality of the letters that had been issued was raised and therefore that became an issue at that point. Huh? Okay, so from the January meeting of the remuneration committee in 2013 all the way through to October, was there no discussion at your senior management level about, about all this going on? No, because we weren't in the merger until the 6th of August. That's when the, the board decided to go back into it. So yeah. there'd been, there'd been no discussion about it because there was no intention of going but back But even into informal merger. discussion? No. no. Were you aware uh, that that meeting on the 28th of January had taken place to discuss remuneration of people? Yeah, I, I would have known it was taking place, yes. And uh, did anyone inform you as to what happened at that meeting? Uh, I'm sure we got feedback from um, it probably would be the principal, John Doyle, at the time to say what the outcome was. Um, and obviously we did receive a, a letter from the chair of the board yeah. um, offering us a, a package on yes. the 7th of February. Yes. And did John Doll presumably met you and other executive colleagues on a, what, a weekly basis? Yes, uh, it was very inclusive at the time, yeah. Uh, all the way from January right through to when he left at the end of October? He, he was off for a period of sick as well. Um, right. now I can't remember the dates of that, but th there was a, a number of weeks that he wasn't present. And at those regular staff meetings, management meetings, what was the... The, the, presumably the merger process was discussed every week? No, no, because we, we weren't in... Uh, uh, from February 25th, we were not in a merger process. But you were back into it by the summer? By, by the 6th of August. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. But, but, OK, well, from the 6th of August onwards, it was discussed. And presumably one of the things that the management team would have discussed is their own positions, given it was a private meeting involving the management team. Well, I think all the management team wanted to be part of New College Lancer. Yes. You know, so that was the aim. It wasn't to, to take a severance package. Um, that, that was our aim, to be part of that, that, that new But college. after, if I recall from the earlier evidence, after August, for Mr Boyle certainly knew he wasn't going to, well, we know he'd been applying for other jobs, for example. Presumably some of the rest of you had been as well. Um, <laughs> Quite I'm not aware of, any, I'm not aware of anyone uh, applying for jobs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the, on the point about um, the evidence you gave earlier on saying that the lawyers replaced the auditors, that's extraordinary. Not necessarily, no. no. But they're not an auditor. No, but You're, they, they, they're in charge of money. The lawyers certainly not. I mean, I've never put my lawyer in charge of my bank account. <laughs> 
I, don't, so you wouldn't uh, auditors uh, do charge money as well. Um, they certainly charge money, but they're not in charge of it. Yes. There's a difference. No, um, but the process was that the Bigger Bail had the expertise. Because of the particular issues that were arising from the issue of those letters, they had the particular expertise to address the HR and legal issues that might arise from those letters. That's entirely true, I am sure, but that's not the point. Internal auditors are a very different function. I hardly need to tell a director of finance. But but the function of the internal auditors was really to go through the process to make sure that was adhered to in terms of scheme of delegation, the, the control points that were there. Yeah. What uh, Bigger Bailey easily had the skills to do that. But it was. But did you feel, and do you now feel, the internal audit was a retrospective exercise, as you pointed out about the, the external auditor in, in 2013? Obviously, we did talk to them uh, before Mr Doyle left, and at that point... Uh, that payment still could have been stopped because Mr Doyle was obviously an employee up to the 31st of October. So having that meeting on the 28th of October could have stopped that payment as well. And during those regular discussions with the internal auditor, did the business case ever get discussed? Uh, I'm not aware of it being discussed no. with them. Did, so you can't recall if they asked whether one had been prepared? I'm not aware of it. And again, um, the audit, internal audit should have actually carried out an audit needs assessment um, yes, once it was exactly. announced that we were going to merger, which would have changed the focus of their work plan that had been previously agreed by the audit committee, yeah. which obviously they did do, Wyland Bissett did do that for New College Lancashire, for all three colleges uh, in January 2014. So they agreed that work plan, mm -hmm. whilst there were still auditors with Coatbridge College. So I do struggle to see why they didn't do that for us as well, give that advice. Okay, and since the lawyers have now become de facto the auditors, um, did the lawyers conduct a business case, to your knowledge? I'm not aware of that. No. And did they ask you about it? Did they ask you what was the guidance that should be followed for th these procedures? No. 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 So, what, so how could they be so good at auditing if they didn't appear to be aware of any of the guidance that related to how you audit an organisation on an ongoing basis? Uh, obviously, you will be getting bigger bailey in to, to have that. Well, you were director of finance. I think you obviously yeah. in discussions with them very closely. And, yeah, yeah. But, but I didn't give them the remit in terms of... Who did give them the remit? That would have been Mr Doyle oh, Mr. Mr. Gray. Okay. Did he discuss that remit with you or with other colleagues of the management team? Yeah, I mean, he described it in, in, in terms of what they were brought in to do, and I think he's already given evidence to that effect. And, and what do you, can you recall, or do, is there a, a piece of paper which was written? No, you know, it was an oral arrangement? Yes. It was just a spoken yes. arrangement? So at a management team meeting, Mr Doyle said, we're going to bring in these lawyers, and this is why. Do you all agree? Is that yes. kind of how it yeah. happened? Yeah, and I had that discussion with uh, Mr Keenan as chair of the audit committee as well. He was part of that discussion? Not that discussion, but I had a separate conversation with okay. him. Okay, and can you just enlighten the committee as to what Mr Doyle said in saying we should bring these lawyers in and here's why? Well, I think he's on record, as being the witness uh, a few weeks ago, to say that they were brought in to, to make sure that uh, the, the remission committee had all the, the, the guidance that was required, yes. all the information in terms of what would be required of, uh, of them to make that decision. Yeah, okay. Um, and, and just uh, finally... Um, on the on the business cases, um, do, you, do you think uh, did, do you have to did you have to prepare or oversee business cases for other areas of expenditure? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So it was quite a normal part of of director of finance responsibilities. It, it would have been. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the other one I just wanted to ask, sorry, convener, was about the the four hundred thousand pounds that Mrs. Scanlon raised earlier on. Um, the funding council paid X, and there was a gap of four hundred thousand pounds. Where did it come from? That been from college funds. Uh, but college funds is a loose and amorphous term. What do you mean by college fund? Well, from, from the income that was generated uh, through activities, obviously we have funds available to us. Uh -huh. But income from gen activities is also <laughs> college income that comes from the funding council because you're pay you were paid at that time sums yep. for students. Yep. So that money could have gone to, to students and, and enhancing the performance of your college for students. No, I, I don't think that, that necessarily uh, material impacted on them because at the point in time when I left... I was predicting a £34,000 surplus, yep. even within, within, within that extra £400,000. But you'd accept £400,000 could have been spent on lots of things, including the infrastructure of your buildings or the... Well, well the, the building had already gone through a restructuring, um, which you spent £28 million on, uh -huh. uh, which I was in charge of. Um, so it did not require any further work no. to it. No, but... So everything was fine. So students were absolutely hunky-dory. They didn't need any more money for spent on services for them or college courses for them or things like that. No, so it's fine to pay off vast amounts of money to senior executives. We to obviously met our, our SRUMS target and all the, the KPIs that were necessary for the funding council. So yeah. um, I, I don't see there being any particular detriment to, to the students. Right. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Banks, just to touch one, one small point on the business case. Where a business case has a financial implication, would you normally expect the director of finance to be involved in the production of that business case? 
Not necessarily. Where, where it was um, particularly uh, for individuals concerned, I would not necessarily see that, and particularly around the Rooney Committee as well. So they would not have to take into account the affordability? Yes, I would have been told the um, overall value of any business case, but not the specifics of it. So you were involved in the business case? In terms of the, being told the value of it, then yes. So you agreed the financial implications at that time? I was aware of them, yes. You agreed them? No, no. It wasn't for me to agree or disagree with. The, the Rooney Committee had made those but arrangements. But you must have signed off on the financial implication. I was aware of the, the funds that were required. It's not the same thing. But it wasn't my responsibility to sign it off or make that decision in terms of... I wasn't saying paid. sign off the business case, but to, to uh, at least accede to the fact that uh, it was affordable. Yes, it would have been. So you signed off saying it was affordable at that time? I would have told them it would be affordable at the time, yes. Okay. Um, who's, who was it that said that Bigger Bailey were going to be the substitute for the auditors? Well, that, that had been in terms of the remit that was given to them um, through Mr Doyle. Through Mr Doyle. But, so Mr Doyle decided to... Would, wouldn't this be going round your back, appointing a substitute auditor? No, no. Uh, I, was, I had a discussion with Mr Keenan, Chair of the Audit Committee, and uh, once we had known the remit, we agreed that that would be the best approach to take. Was that a minuted meeting? Uh, no, it wouldn't be. It would, so it was a informal? Call. Yes. Bigger Bailey say that they didn't take any instructions from Mr Doyle. Is that correct? I have no idea. I can't well, but you just that. told me that Mr Doyle instructed Bigger Bailey. Yes. But so I Mr don't Doyle know instructed he... Bigger Bailey. Did he then agree the remit with Bigger Bailey? He must have, because it, it wasn't me. He must have. But I say again, Bigger Bailey say they took no instructions from Mr Doyle. I, I cannot comment on that. I wasn't there. I don't know the conversations that were had. So as Director of Finance, you didn't know the remit that uh, an external party was being given in order to come in and substitute as auditors for the college? No, no. Mr Doyle had outlined the remit. Mr Doyle did. Your question was, did that remit get communicated to Bigger Bailey? Mm. I, I don't know. Them. I do, I, I'm not It wasn't quite what my question was. Bigger Bailey are saying they took no instructions from Mr Doyle which implies that uh, your understanding is incorrect. But who did they take instruction from then? I don't know. I'm asking you. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. It wasn't, wasn't me that gave okay. that instruction to Bigger Bailey. So to be clear, you believe that Mr Doyle gave the instructions to Bigger Bailey and, and, uh, and defined the remit and that you were not involved in any other way? Yes. Okay. Can I ask... Just to confirm the accounting cycle for the, for the college, my understanding is that in 2013, the accounting cycle finished on the 31st of July for that year. Mm -hmm. yes. And then the following year, it finished on the 31st of March. That's correct. Now, coming back to the, this famous meeting of the 28th of January, at that meeting, SFC guidance, SFC year 2000 guidance on severance payments, were you aware of that in your capacity as Director of Finance? Yes. You were. Were you aware of uh, Mark Bather's email to John Gray on the 24th of January stating that the college should notify its internal and external auditors of planned severance payments? And, of course, that's backed up by the SFC document. Yes, I was aware of that. Did you take any action on that? Again, I refer back to the guidance itself, and, and particularly paragraph 36, where we talk about external audit being post-event. So I don't think that's an issue. In terms of the internal audit, it is really um, the, the process was replaced by Bigger Bailey. But I mean, this, well, Bigger Bailey didn't come in until uh, much later. But you, what so, I'm sorry, saying but is that when you, you, you had this guidance in place, you had it in your hands, you knew about the email to John Gray of 24th January, both of which say that college should notify its internal and external auditors, who would have been responsible for doing that? But bear in mind, as soon as we came out of the merger on the 25th of February, there was no issue with that. There was no agreement, no liability for any severance arrangements. So you're saying everything just fell away? Well, there was no requirement for bringing the internal audit because there was no agreement, because we'd come out of the merger. Now, in Lorraine Gunn's submission, under due diligence, there's reference here to the letters, the severance letters that were issued to senior staff. 
and that the letters I quote were certainly issued, were certainly provided on at least two occasions. They were sent to the auditors, who deny receipt, as part of the initial due diligence request, and were then resent when Coatbridge rejoined. Now, twice these severance letters were sent to the auditors, apparently, both before and after Coatbridge pulled out and then went back in. But the auditors say they were unaware of this, and they've got this in writing, unaware of this until April 2014. How does that work? Who sent these letters? I think for clarity, the, the auditors on the due diligence were different from internal and external auditors for the college. So it would have been, the letters would have been issued to the, the due diligence team to carry out that assessment. Who would have issued these letters? There was a, a, a website where we were required to upload documents to it. So between myself and, and Mrs Gunn, they, we actually uploaded those documents. So the severance letters were uploaded onto the intranet, which we've already explored a little bit. No, no, it wasn't our intranet. It no. was the, the auditor's website. The auditor's website. website. Can we clarify that it's the internal and external auditors? No, no, it's not. There was different teams for internal, external and due diligence. Different one for due diligence? Yes. Who are the auditors for due diligence? Um, it was Scott Moncrief. And Scott Moncrief. And Anderson Strathairn for the legal side of this. This is something new that we're getting here. I mean, this is... <laughs> so, what was their function in terms of due diligence? The, the due diligence team were obviously appointed to make sure that, um, that, that Coatbridge was no impediment to Appointed by whom and when? Um, they would have been appointed, I think, by New College Lancashire. Um, shortly after the announcement of the merger on the 6th of August. Ah. So approximately what date would that be? August? Um, I think it would have been probably mid-August by the time actually they were appointed and we started carrying out the work, and that work would have been completed round about the end of September, I believe. What was their remit specifically? The, the, there is, obviously, they have to check that um, Coatbridge is in a fit state and should become part of the merger process. Now... Looking at uh, Lorraine Gunn's uh, submission here, it says the letters were sent on two occasions as part of due diligence. Now, that, uh, maybe I can get a clarification there. The first, let the first letters were sent, presumably, in January or thereabouts, I'm assuming, well, well, after the letters were first issued, which no, I believe is the 29th of January. Not for due diligence, it wouldn't have been. When would I, I don't know what two occasions that Mrs Gunn's talking about, but they were only issued once to the due diligence team between mid-August and September. No, that's not what Lorraine Gunn is saying here. Perhaps you can I, clarify. I, I genuinely thought it was twice that we had done that, so that we'd submitted paperwork twice. For due diligence? For due diligence. Yeah. The due diligence didn't start until August. So it's like you're saying that these letters were sent as part of the due diligence after Coatbridge went back into the merger? It would have been, yes. And they were sent by Scott McCreef? No, they were received by Scott Moncrief. To received assess. by Scott Moncrief. Who issued them? Well, it, Mrs. Um, Gunn myself would have uploaded them onto the website. So this is a re, this is a reissue of these letters. Were they the same letters as were issued previously? Was there any changes? Mm. No changes. No changes. Not that I recall. So these letters, which are being issued to senior members of staff. They go a copy goes to Scott Moncrief, or they go to Scott Moncrief who issue them. So a copy would have been uploaded to the website which Scott McCreef had access to to carry out their due diligence work. Now, as part of that process, they would have contacted both internal and external audit about the due diligence work to assure themselves that Cobridge College was a fit partner in that merger. But the, the, the auditors are saying that they were not contacted and they had no information on this. We have it in writing. They had no information on this until April 2014, yep. which is substantially after payments were made and everything was... Tied up. Yep. No, it's part of the due diligence work. The uh, Scotland Creef would have to have contacted internal and external audit to ensure themselves that they, they um, were satisfied that Coatbridge College was a fit partner in that merger. And did they sign off in, in that regard? I, I, I can't comment on that. Why not? I have no knowledge if, if they did or not. But you were there until 31st March 2014. Yeah. When did the due diligence <coughs> process finish? It would have been probably at the end of September. Um, where End of Scott September 2013. 13, which Scott McCreef would have issued a report to both uh, Corpus College and New College Lancashire boards. And did you see a copy? Yes, I did, yes. And did they sign off? 
Yes. We, we, they Does that qualify? No, there's no qualification on it. They were deemed fit to be a partner of that merger. Can I come back to another, que another point that was raised under due diligence by Lorraine Gunn? Uh, the auditors in a merger management group meeting on the 7th of October 2013 presented the due diligence reports and highlighted the voluntary seven scheme for Cope Bridge College senior staff. Now, I presume by auditors you mean the internal and external auditors were present at that meeting. The auditors... I would have thought it would have been yeah. the auditor, Scott and Creef, as the due diligence auditors who yeah. presented that report. I don't want to put words, but so, it's no, no, so, no, no, no. so are we saying it would not be the external or internal auditors that were present at that meeting? And in the references <laughs> that I've got in that document, I believe that I'm referring to Scott Moncrief. As auditors? Yes. As opposed to... Yeah, I perhaps just have confused the okay. terminology, so forgive me if I've misled you. I mean, the clarification I'm trying to get here is, in spite of all the recommendations to involve internal external audit, it doesn't seem to have happened. Who would be responsible for doing that? I think I've already stated that Bigger Bailey were brought in to replace internal audit. External audit can be post-event, um, and, and that's recognised within the guidance that the uh, Funding Council had issued. Well, Bigger Bailey are post-event. I mean, they, were no. brought to, they, they didn't report until November. Yes, but they were brought in before Mr Doyle left, and yep, the agreement not, had been made. Not far before, I have to say. OK, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of areas uh, that I'd like to uh, see a bit of clarification on. Uh, first one is just um, that this has come up in previous evidence sessions um, when, in terms of the issue of the, the funding and also the, the bank accounts. Now, as Director of Finance, how many accounts would you have worked with? Will it have been one uh, for the main, uh, the main area of business, or, and would there have been a second one for the money that would have come in through commercial activities? No, th th there was two accounts, but one would be for student funds and one would be for the no normal run, uh, business as usual, of the College. Right. So in terms of any commercial activity that the College undertook, uh, the result, that, that particular income will have went into the main account, yes. uh, and so there, there was no, no differentiation in terms of how monies were paid out? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of the, this, this meeting of the 28th of January and then the meeting that took place, or the decision that took place in February, this, this came up uh, in your evidence this morning, and colleagues have questioned <coughs> it. Um, now, you have uh, stated in the record today that uh, because of the decision in, in, uh, in February not to continue with the merger, uh, then that would have nullified um, nullified any liabilities. So would that have nullified any agreement or any decision taken regarding the severance payments at the meeting on the 28th of January? That, that's my opinion, yes. Um, particularly because the letters issued to the senior team also had a, a, a termination date of the 31st of July on them as well. So uh, well, I mean, that's your opinion, but if that actually were to have been the case, uh, then at what point in this whole process, because it made I mean, obviously various meetings are taking place and, uh, and, and also just found out some other information there as well. But at what point then would the final decision have been taken to agree the severance payments for uh, the individuals that, uh, that we're here talking about today, if, if they had been nullified on February? The, the final decision w w was, as far as I understand, carried out on the 23rd of October by the remuneration committee meeting. Mm. Right, OK. Uh, okay, on the Scott Moncrief, which is, I mean, that's further information up to, that's just been new to us today. Um, how, well, so they were introduced into this because of the, uh, because it isn't to then go into the merger process. Yes, uh, obviously we have to make sure that each partner within that merger is in a fit state to be to, to merge and there's no impediment to that merger. Right, so in, ter in terms of meetings that will have taken place uh, uh, post the, well, from the decision to uh, go into the merger, uh, were Scott and were they in attendance at, uh, at all, all, uh, all the, the subsequent meetings from that point onwards? No, they, they would not have attended any of the, the college no. meetings. No, there were specific meetings set up to discuss the due diligence report, uh, and that, that was through the merger management group of New College Lancashire. Right. Okay, okay, thank you. Underway. Right. 
Thank you very much, Ian, and good morning. morning. Could I just go over slightly, Mr Banks, uh, some of the answers you'd given earlier and picking up from Stuart McMillan uh, in regards to, and, and obviously Tavi Scott as well. And from what I can, can make out of it and clarify is we went into merger with all the other colleges, Coatbridge College pulled out, and that was about the 31st of July they were looking to come back either back in or have severance pay for themselves and as a college on its own. No, at that <coughs> point, there wasn't any discussion about severance payments. The board decided on the 6th of August to go into the merger with New College of Lancashire. Right, so but what you'd said earlier on was that whilst they were in the process of all the colleges going in together, yep. it was acceptable for the severance pay to go forward, but then Coatbridge College pulled out. Yes. And then they re-entered to a new negotiation, yes. as you may say. Now, I think we all know that colleges have um, holidays, as you might mm -hmm. say. So we're talking about 31st of July, then you're talking about August. When would the college, per se, start back again? This all seemed to happen in this void when the colleges were not in session. Um, I think uh, traditionally colleges would start back at the, at the tail end of August in terms of mm -hmm. welcoming students back and getting them on board. So a lot of... A lot of discussion seems to have taken place, or movement was taking place between when the college wasn't actually sitting. Oh no, the college would still sit. I mean, obviously yourselves. Yes, um, most of the, the team would been in over the holidays. Uh, we, most of the team wouldn't have had academic holidays, and therefore we would have been available to meet as well. And obviously, there were extraordinary meetings of the board, uh, and they met on the sixth of August. No, it's very. You know, I would assume that you would have had holidays of some sort. Yes. You know, I think uh, lectures and people like that deserve a holiday. So quite amazing that uh, you were ready. People were there ready to come in to renegotiate a new contract because obviously, as you said, Stuart McMillan, the severance pay part fell, and you had to renegotiate a new severance pay. No, the senior team did not renegotiate anything uh, in terms of their severance arrangements. So that still stood, although you said it nullified. Yes, uh -huh. so there, there was no agreement, as far as I'm concerned, uh, post 31st of July yeah. and actually mm -hmm. post the 25th of February yeah. with the senior team because there was going to be no merger yeah. and yes. it was time limited up to 31st of July. Well, anyway. that's, that's the point I wanted to, to clarify, basically. There yeah. was no agreement and then you were entered into another uh, arrangement yes. in that respect. Yeah. Could I also ask you uh, something you mentioned earlier on, and it was to, regarding Mr Keenan, and just if you could clarify for me there. You mentioned that Mr Keenan's position as chair didn't come into force until the 1st of November. That's correct. So would Mr Keenan as being acting chair of the board at the time when these you know, payments were being made, he would not be responsible then? If he, You mentioned he, it didn't come into force until the 1st. Of November. Yeah, officially he, he would not take over responsibilities from Mr Gray until the 1st of November. Um, right. But he was the chair of the audit committee at that point. Yeah, but I'm asking you about the remuneration committee. Not he the he would not be the chair separate. of the remuneration committee at that point. So it would be Mr Gray who was yes. responsible, not Mr Keenan? Mr Gray would be the chair of the remuneration committee at that point. Time. Yes, that's good. Thank you very much for clarifying that point for me. Uh, Ms, Ms Gunn, if I could just uh, come back to yourself. You mentioned the fact that you were... Um, ask the chair about an extraordinary meeting to convene an extraordinary meeting. Can you? Um, oh, sorry, I can read. Can I can read what you said. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, basically, I don't want to read the whole thing. There was certainly speculation amongst my senior colleagues and elsewhere within the college at the time that it would only be a matter of time before Coatbridge and South Lanarkshire would be joining, and the chair did ask me to convene an extraordinary meeting of the full board to discuss the potential merger on the 16th of January yes. 2013. And basically, your role basically was to tell them exactly what was, you know, advice you could give in regards to that, that meeting. And one part of the advice you were to give was the role of the principal and what severance arrangements they would wish to make available in the event that John Doyle did not secure alternative employment as part of the future merger arrangements. At that time, were you aware that Mr Doyle had applied for... Other, another post or post and was not successful in this? Um, yes, I was aware you were, of that. You, you, yeah. you, you were aware of that, that's fine. And just another one I wanted to raise. Um, obviously, you mentioned the fact that Mr Doyle was very upset. I mean, I can read out that uh, you had a conversation with John, John Doyle prior to his departure. 
or your departure, sorry, to put arrangements in place that I believe would protect the governance arrangements going forward, and that was to get legal representation. Was that Bigot and Bailey yes. as well at that particular yeah. point in that respect? Um, obviously, you seem to be, you know, pretty uh, upset. Probably, I don't mean that to put that the words uh, about Mr. Doyle. You know, possibly the way he was treated and him leaving. Would that be a correct assumption of the evidence you've given here? No, I was particularly upset in terms of how some of my board colleagues dealt with myself. Well, right. OK, could you maybe expand on that? And, then, and I suppose it's, it's fair to say, you know, on a, you know, a sort of professional level, um, I was keen to ensure that there was as much clarity as possible, is probably the best way I've got of describing mm -hmm. it for members of the team, because I think it was um, a difficult time. I think whenever any organisations are involved in merger, I think it's the scope there for, for both senior staff and the team to be concerned. You know, and I just wanted to make sure that enough information as possible is provided in that environment. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I think it's fair to say that I think Mr Doyle was upset in as much as there was lots of conversation going on in the background with organisations such as the Funding Council, etc., and I was aware that discussions were taking place about the possible early departure of him as an individual. And, you know, and I think in an organisation where people are feeling vulnerable already, mm. I think that sort of promoted that vulnerability, if you like, within that environment. The idea that you're losing your chief exec in the midst mm. of it all and you're changing over arrangements and, you know... I'm sorry. Th thank you, Ms. Gunn. Yeah. Well, you're not aware that Mr Doyle had indicated that, you know, he... He had said that he knew he wouldn't be getting the job there, and he had indicated before, months and months before this, that he was going to depart. That's why he applied for another job. I think the way I viewed it is, I think uh, individuals in those circumstances did feel vulnerable, where there wasn't clarity. You know, I think if there were opportunities coming up, I think all of us as individuals had to think, well, mm. should we protect our futures and, and move forward into other opportunities, as it were? Yeah. Um, and I don't think Mr Doyle was any different in that, but I think in terms of how he felt about it more specifically and you know, and anything related to that, I think you'd have to speak directly to him about that. I wouldn't wish to put, no, I, 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 to put words no, to I'll, it, almost. I'll leave, I'll leave it at that, Thank you very much. Okay. Just, yeah. Yes, I, I want to be very clear about just one or two things, so if I, you could just confirm so that I've got it right in my mind. On the 16th of January, the Chair asked you to call a meeting of the Remuneration Committee. Your role was then to prepare the agenda and the papers. I know they weren't hard copy papers, but... I understood it, the, the, and we were moving towards that. We're, we're talking about... We're to, sorry, can you just clarify? You're 16th, talking about of Jan, 16th of January, the Chair asked you to call a meeting... Are you talking the about the Remuneration Committee on the, the remuneration 28th? Committee. Right. Um, in terms of the Remuneration Committee, um, he said that what he wanted to do was to talk to the committee about the principal, the post of the principal and the rest of the senior team. He asked me in advance of that to get him some information. Yes. Um, he did anticipate that he would want to talk about um, potentially severance arrangements. Yes. And thus, you know, I highlighted... Um, the need for them to speak to the funding council, yeah. read the guidance, make sure the committee members were aware of all of that. Um, but as I understood it, it was a single item agenda to, to discuss the way forward. So it was a single item agenda, but you didn't have to issue that agenda. You were this, I mean, I understand your role as providing a secretariat support to the remuneration committee. So did that mean that you issue, normally issued an agenda for these meetings, even at when they were taking place? I was comfortable about doing um, the agenda for them. Yes. But what I wasn't comfortable about doing would have been attending the meeting necessarily unless it was just in an information-giving capacity. So um, at the were... end of the day, you know, it would have been a conflict of interest for me to have been participating in discussion, for instance. Right. In terms so... of the decision-making process. So at normal remuneration committees... You, prepare, you prepared the minutes, or who prepared? Who was responsible for preparing the minutes? What would normally happen is that the chair would summarise at the end of a meeting and would give me, after the event, that summary, which I would put into a minute format, but the chair would circulate it for approval, ultimately. But so I wouldn't actually table that until 
another meeting comes up. So it was the chair's responsibility to do the minutes of this committee, not you. You just simply copied out what Can you clarify you what you mean by do the minutes? Because well, I acted as a secretariat for it to, to put them together. But you were acting as a secretariat to that committee, although it's not a committee that you were attending. That's right. Although I did attend on that that's, occasion that's, because I was asked a, to give advice. A very interesting, very, very interesting. Well, if I um, haven't clarified, then yeah, I'm happy so, to clarify any aspects. But the other, yes, yeah, thank you. The other bit of this is that they, you said that normally the papers for that committee were put up on the intranet. Yes. They weren't hard copy papers. No. That was the standard procedure yes. at all remuneration committee meetings. At all board meetings. All board meetings as well. So yes. you, were, you were paperless. Yes. Great stuff. Yes. Good. Um, but that means that the remuneration committee had an obligation to always then look on the intranet to see what all the papers were. Yes. Right. So that clarifies the fact that the remuneration committee then should have had yes. available the guidance that you put on, yes. the reference to having dug it out of the archives. Yes, and if I haven't made that clear, I hope it is no, now I clear think, for well, you. Well, I think I've got that re really now very Good. clear. Uh, can I move on to, to Mr Banks? Mr Banks, uh, am I reading this correctly, that the financial statement at the end of 2013-14 showed a deficit at the end of the year, the 1.2 million? <coughs> I haven't seen the accounts. You haven't seen the accounts. No, well, I didn't prepare them or, or see them. I'm reading here from my papers. The college financial statement for 13-14 showed that the college had a year-end deficit of 1.002 million, but you were predicting a £34,000 surplus. Yes, I was. So what, you were still in employment at the 31st of March. I you, you left. First, yes. So be, between you are making a prediction that the college could afford these uh, generous payments mm -hmm. and the actual uh, the accounts being completed things had swung from a 34,000 surplus predicted by you to a 1.002 million deficit. How do you account for that? I can't. I wasn't there. But you were till the 31st of March, and you presumably were preparing financial statements on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and you would be l tracking all your budget items and saying what was above budget and below budget on a quarterly basis or a weekly? Oh, monthly. Monthly basis. Yeah. So every month you'd be predicting that. Yes. So as you went through to the end of March... Your accounts were still showing a 34,000 uh, uh, surplus, yes. but the actual accounts, when they were finally produced, showed a, mil a million pound deficit. Yes. Can you explain that? No, I can't. As a financial officer, should you be able to explain that? No, there, there's always post events that um, happen through an audit process, uh, and some of those you know, um, can, can vary in terms of what they are, but I wasn't there in, in terms of the process. I did offer to stay to complete the accounts, but that was rejected. I see. So, right. I, I asked, requested it through Tom Keenan, who I think talked to New College Lancashire, um, and that was rejected. And that's why I was then on a retainer to try and help out. That's fair enough. Yeah, okay. I think that, 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 that's quite helpful. That's quite helpful. I think that's... Um, okay. Uh, Nigel Don. Oh, sorry. I did, there is one more. Just to be very clear, we've got an internal auditor who was effectively sidelined and replaced by Billy Gifford. We've got an external auditor who'd not normally be involved until post the audit accounts, and I understand that. And we had now got, we've discovered, a Scotland Creef doing due diligence. Yes. Would it be your understanding that as part of that due diligence, they would be checking your view that there was a £34,000 surplus and uh, looking as if it was coming along? Uh, and would, it, would they actually be looking at the severance payments and were they included in your 34,000 surplus? Um, yes to both. Obviously, um, at that point in time, that would have been September of that year. Yes. Um, so only into the financial year by a couple of months. Yes. And so obviously the forecast would have been difficult. And I can't remember if they did a further check closer to the um, investing day in, in March or not. Right. But they would have checked that our predictions and our previous performances were consistent with what we were saying at that time. And obviously the letters were issued sorry, to, to um, uh, Scotland Creef, which included all, all the uh, severance arrangements. And can, can I just sorry, have one final question while I remember? Uh, it's really Mrs Gunn. In terms of a severance payment, uh, would that normally be issued by yourself or Mr Banks or jointly? Because we're told that the meeting on the 28th of January made decisions about the principal severance arrangements a letter was issued on the 29th and responded to on the 29th going from uh, John Gray's chair to, to John Doyle and 
coming back saying we're accepting it. So the whole deal was sewn up within 24 hours of that remuneration committee, even before the minutes were approved, which we now know would have gone through yourself. So have you any comments on that procedure? Is that the procedure you would have expected to be followed? Is, is the question about the timing or actually who well, the question can is, I mean, a payment? Well, it's a question of both of the timing and the fact that the, the, the severance payment was issued not by you as head of HR or by you as the finance officer in terms of this is what the remuneration committee have now decided and approved the minutes of. You know, I'm just yeah. trying to get to the governance of this. It seems an extraordinary situation that it would be rushed through and done by the chairman to the, to, to, the, to the principal and back again within 24 hours of a committee meeting, the minutes of which had not been approved and the, and the governance of which, as you as finance officer and you as the, the head of HR, had not actually been involved in. You're signed up. So you, 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 you're just you're saying that, that is that the governance arrangement you would have expected? It's what happened, but is that does that you know do you have a comment on that? It certainly was a quick turnaround, um, but um, I can't quick, comment any quick on is that. the <laughs> yes. Ms. Gunn, are you, are you would you normally issue these severance letters? I would normally do, if in the context, I mean, let me take pay, for example, um, because remuneration committee would do um, the um, letters to the senior staff about um, any offers that the board were making to them about pay. In that kind of context, yes, I would do the secretariat on behalf of the chair um, for those arrangements. So but it would be the chair who would sign off the documentation. I'm merely providing the secretariat for that. Right. And you did not, on this occasion, provide the secretariat for the letter. You didn't actually have the letter prepared um, for well Mr they, Gray this, to sign. I assisted in the Secretariat in terms of um, making sure it was all put together, but it was on instruction in terms of what the content of it was going to be. And the final thing is that we hear that the minutes didn't really come out until October. Is that... That, that, was, know, a, that was a standard practice, and as I understood it... So the minutes were not circulated be. for even so technical I approval. On such and, an important event involving £304,000 of college money, the minutes were not actually sent back to say, this is what we've agreed, are we all signed up to it? Um, uh, as I say, it, would have been the, it was the custom and practice to do it in that way, and at the, I recall at the end of the meeting, the chair did do a summary with everyone round that table where he said, right, we are confirming the following for this committee meeting. Right. And, and just finally, Mr. Matt, uh, you said you've said repeatedly that your understanding was that after the college withdrew from the merger process on the 25th of February, at that point, all bets were off. All the letters issued were actually null and void. Yes. What basis we have you got for saying that? Because the information we have from Bailey Gifford's advice is that actually that was a legally binding document offered to the principal that was, was, was extant on the... On the, in October and it could not be reversed. So the remuneration committee were faced with a fait accompli, which they subscribed to, but nevertheless that was all done and dusted and couldn't be altered. So your view and that of the, of the next group that we're having in front of us are in complete and utter contradiction. Yep. Uh, how do you, you know, what, what? I mean, the severance arrangements were made on the basis that we were going to, to merger. Yeah. And once the Clearly, we were off, not going into merger until well later on. We didn't know that was going to happen, but as far as I'm concerned, that there would be no liability then. So, Ms. Gunn, as HR, you're the expert, and we are not. As HR, would you regard that as being appropriate? That once the college pulled out any documentation related to, in, uh, to uh, matters prior to that, in terms of severance. Were, were then null and void. Was that, would that be your opinion? Um, in terms of how the letter was structured, um, what I was unclear about was whether or not, because there was a date in there, as I recall, in terms of the, the severance arrangement letters, that where it was linked to... The 31st of July. The 31st of July. Yes. So for me, um, I thought that the letter was a legitimate letter, but I wasn't sure as to whether or not that would constitute, in a, you know, in a court of law, You'd have to ask a lawyer that question as to whether or not it would stand or not. That's, thank you very much. Uh, can I just continue on, on those two themes? Um, um, first of all, can I just carry on that conversation with Lorraine Gunn, please? Mm -hmm. Would John Doyle's 
letter, severance letter of the 28th, sorry, 29th of January, would that, apart from the fact the numbers would have been different, would that have been any different from the other ones that were given to the other senior staff? My recollection is I, do, I don't recall it being different, but I'm sure that they'll make that information available to you. Well, I have to say I think it would be enormously useful if somebody could make that information available to us, because it would be very nice to know what's there. Well, Mr Doyle's file, I would imagine, will be with New College Lanarkshire at this moment in time, so the file is available and all the information will be on that file. Right. But right you. in front of me at this moment in time, without yeah. looking at the detail, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Could I then ask you whether you would have seen that agreement? You may not be able to remember every detail of it, but was that a letter that w would have come across your desk before it got to Mr Doyle? Are you talking about the letter or are you talking about the legal um, compromise agreement? Can you just clarify for me what well, you mean by agreement? I, I'm assuming they're the same thing because you can, sorry, I, effectively I'm looking at the, uh, the agreement, the compromise agreement or whatever it was that he would have been able to sign which would have turned into the contract which couldn't subsequently be changed. Um, well, I believe that they are in the main standard documents. The only thing that would differ, I would imagine, in Mr Doyle's agreement would have been the termination date. Yes, and the numbers which and, were always And the unique. numbers would be different. Right, but then I come back to my question. Did you, did you see that document? I would have seen it at one point in time, I would have thought, for, to, to make it part of the record. But you wouldn't have seen it before the chairman put it in front of Mr Doyle and he signed it. So it wouldn't have needed your agreement? No, no, yes, I did see it before. I'm sure I did see it before in terms of timing. Okay. Because I would have facilitated in terms of getting that agreement from the lawyers um, for him to sign it. Right, and all of it that would been, It would have been my role to contact Bigger and Bailey <coughs> to assist, and I would have assisted the chair to do that on instruction to get them to complete a draft agreement. And that all happened in 24 Dodd's hours? Sign. That all happened on the 29th of January, or 28th and 29th of January, because we're being told that it was signed and dusted on the 29th. Is that normal practice? I would generally try and do, you know, turn things around as quickly as I can. Um, okay, I, I don't want to be unkind, but we, so this was so important that we would get agreement from the lawyers and everything done in 24 hours. I'm just slightly surprised it was suddenly deemed to be that important. Very few things in life seem to move quite that fast. Okay, if, that, if that's what For me, I was satisfied that um, we met all the requirements in terms of um, due diligence, in terms of signatures and what needed to be done and, you know, and what the content of said documents was going to be. Yeah, okay. So uh, the fact that it was 24 hours, well, that, will, that is just a matter of the record now. Yeah. That's fine. Can I take you back to the meeting then on the 28th? Because your view of the information that was given to the committee and, and their statements last week do seem to be different. Mm -hmm. you, you, I think you, you said that the chairman had passed on the contents of his conversation with the head of the funding council. Can you give me any clues as to who it was on the committee or how it was that the committee decided to do something else? Who introduced the alternative numbers which were agreed to? Um, that, would have, that was a discussion that was led by the chair himself, by the chair of the board. He was the one who introduced the, um, the discussion around the, well, he was chairing the meeting. So he introduced the discussion around um, a potential severance arrangement for the principal. So he would have introduced both the current funding council relatively low numbers, which he had just discovered, and also the relatively high numbers, mm -hmm. which were actually agreed. Yes. So he would have led the whole of that discussion. Yes. Thank you. What I can't speak for, can I just clarify for mm -hmm. you though, I wasn't there for about the first 15, 20 minutes of the meeting. So I don't know if there was any prior discussion. That you, know, you would have to speak to other committee members about that part of the meeting. I didn't join until I think about 15, 20 minutes in. But presumably the, well, okay, in which case, how much of the discussion about the, the lower or the higher number occurred whilst you were there? Some of, I, I accept the 20 minutes, you won't know, you won't know what happened, but you, you're suggesting that the... 
the both, both, both possible sums were discussed by the chair. Yes. Did that happen in the time and you were whilst, there? And whilst I was there, there was a, a dis the main discussion was around um, the practice that was prevailing, if you like, within the sector, what other colleges were doing, and it was my opportunity, if you like, to go in and give them all of that information. It, I didn't participate <coughs> in the decision aspect of it. Uh, my role, as I saw it going into that meeting, was to provide them yes. with that external information. Yes, I, I, I recognise your conflict of interest. I'm not, yeah. not wanting to disagree with that. Could I then just come back to Mr Banks? Would you have seen Mr Doyle's severance agreement? No. At any point? No, I didn't see it. It wouldn't have been appropriate for me to see that. That's a personal arrangement. Right. I think that actually covers it. Thank you. Got very brief questions, just one minute at the very most from each member, so Mary Scanlon. Uh, okay, can I ask if you were the two senior managers who were still in work at the end of March 2014 who proposed that uh, the two senior managers receive a pay uplift of £4,000 and whether business cases were produced regarding the pay uplift and inclusion of the pay uplift in severance payments uh, and considered by the remuneration committee? Myself and Mrs Linton at the time. Yourself and Mrs Linton? Yes. Linton. Well, Linton, right, Sarah Jane. Right, so you take full responsibility for that, and that were these considered by the remuneration committee? Yeah, they were agreed through uh, Mr. Keenan. And can you ask? Can you tell me what happened to the ninety thousand pounds pension that was offered to uh, Mr. Doyle? That, and that was withdrawn. That yes, why was it withdrawn? I think uh, the remuneration committee met and agreed that that should be withdrawn. Okay, did you sign confidentiality clauses? as part of your uh, severance agreement, and if so, why? And can I ask, Mrs Gunn, uh, do you have any grievance, or did you have any grievance actions against Coatbridge College following your um, departure? Yes, there was a confidentiality agreement, um, but uh, the confidentiality agreement was standard with any um, arrangement um, that was being made um, within the college. So what it wasn't unique, if you like, um, to the senior staff circumstances. What did it prohibit you from talking about? Um, it just prohi it prohib prohibits me talking more generally about um, the details appertaining to that severance arrangement. Thank you. Um, do you want to, sorry, do you want me to answer the question about whether or not I have a, a grievance at this moment in time? Um, at the point at which I left, I had unresolved issues with my board about how they were handling uh, as certain board members in terms of their handling of some of the governance arrangements. Um, and to date, I still hadn't, I, I would say I still haven't fully resolved that with them. So there's still an, a, a legal action ongoing? No, no. Okay. no. No. Thank you. Um, Mr Banks, the letters that were issued to Scotland Creef, the due diligence lawyer, mm -hmm. were issued on what date? To, to Scotland Creef? Yes. Um, it, it, between mid-August and September, end of September. I couldn't uh, give you a date. Between thank you. And, and those letters included the totality of the severance payments that you expected as Director of Finance to have to pay? It would have, to pay? Um, it, it, I think it was actually just the letters that were issued. Um, so that, that would have said you know, 21 months or... 30 months or whatever in terms of those and I think it was actually the auditors who calculated the, the value of that. So the auditors being who? Scotland Reef. Right uh, and, and, the, and, the, and that was after um, that was after uh, the point you made earlier which I thought was exactly right that you thought the severance payments agreed at the meeting in January were null and void because the merger hadn't taken place. Yes. So I'm struggling to understand why then letters were issued to Scott McCreef saying he is the potential liability for severance payments when you very fairly said earlier on there wasn't going to be any. No, and I didn't think there would be, but we gave them all historic documents as well, anything within that year, because yeah. there was a time limit on how much evidence we had to give them. So within that, that year, I think it was, we had to give them all the evidence. So I'm not really following what evidence that would have been. In well, in terms of any documentation uh, relating to that year that could have had an impact on it. So, so they, saw the, they saw the, uh, the agreements agreed yes. at the remuneration committee on the, uh, in yes. January 2013? Yes. But we, when, we, we were told the minutes didn't come out till 
much later in the year. So what documents would those have been? Well, the actual letters themselves. That went to the yes. Mr Doyle and to other, yes. And yes. other people? Yes. Okay. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a, a, a very short, short question. Uh, yes. Uh, talking about letters and letters of comfort in particular, because you mentioned that yourself, Mrs Gunn. You drafted this letter for this principal and senior staff the signatures on the 28th of January and you're stressing your evidence and you do say the word stress but I would stress that they were considered by the senior team to be letters of comfort and they did not consider the letter as an offer as such I just could basically so this is a letter which was sent to the senior managers and obviously to the principal by Mr Gray on the 29th which he signed and on that basis He's looking to the severance pay, but in your evidence, you say, did not consider the letter as an offer as such. Yeah, I mean, as... That's fine, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. No. Uh, uh, let's come back to the, this February meeting uh, and uh, your opinion, Mr Banks, that, uh, that that will have nullified uh, the decisions in January. And you said it was your opinion. Did you make your opinion known to others within, uh, within the College? Um, I'm sure it would have, but I can't, I can't be specific about when, when that was or who to. No. Uh, but any indication? I mean, was it verbally or was it in writing? Was it emails? It would more likely to be verbal. Yeah. Verbal, right. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so th th there would have been no record of that whatsoever? I don't have access to any information uh, from my time at the college. I, that was part of the, the compromise agreement as well. Right, okay, thank you. I just ask finally, is it, unless there's another member's not? Yeah, just, just two final questions. You referred to confidentiality clauses, uh, Ms Gunn, yeah. <coughs> and you'd advised that this was common practice across the... I understood it to be a standard yeah, confidentiality yeah. clause. So, are you aware of the document that the SFC uh, submitted guidance on severance arrangements to senior staff in Scottish Further Education Colleges in 2000? So I take it you're familiar with this document. So you must be familiar with paragraph 32, which actually starts and says, colleges must not agree to confidentiality clauses within severance agreements except where necessary to protect commercially sensitive information. So I take it you and Mr Banks are subject to confidentiality clauses, is that correct? Yes. So uh, as the HR advisor, why did you, I mean, you said you're aware of this document, but you didn't ensure that the terms were followed through. Again, somebody of significant experience as yourself had the responsibility, I take it, for preparing these documents and you couldn't ensure that this was carried through. Why not? I have no specific explanation for that other than, you know, in terms of my due diligence on it, I believed that I had fulfilled the requirement of putting it through our lawyers and making sure that everything in there met those requirements so yeah. you, know. you, you you should have been mm. a significant responsibility that you have within the college you need to be aware of this document i mean it's not a bowling club you're running or a you know it's a, I mean, actually no bowling clubs are, we've actually got more uh, measures in place to ensure proper i do appreciate that mr martin i do, I, mean, that, martin. Practice, I, do t I, I did take my responsibilities very seriously well you didn't because you didn't ensure that the, the guidance has been set out clearly in this document but which you should be aware of wasn't carried through. So, I mean, I think we just need to accept that whilst you took it seriously, you didn't carry it through. I can also refer you just finally uh, to paragraph 27 of a document where it says that there are very few occasions where payment of salary in lieu of notice represents value for money. Now, the information that we have is there's been a significant number of arrangements where there's been payment in lieu of notice. So, again, clear guidance from the Funding Council that sets out it doesn't represent value for money. Did you ever listen to anything the Scottish Funding Council said to you? I mean, do these people just, you know, do you just say, well, oh, very well, but we will ensure that we put in place... Again, all I can say is I, I did take my job very, mm -hmm. very seriously and well, my well, responsibilities very seriously. Well, I'm glad, you know, you didn't take them seriously because then there would be even more of a, a concern to the committee today. I mean, surely these are basic errors that have been in your I part. don't accept that I didn't take my job seriously. Well, I'm advising you that I don't think you have, because here we have <coughs> here a document that you, you that, that should be the Bible of the Scottish Funding Council. This must be the absolute basis by which you go about your business. It clearly didn't happen. Can you just ask finally, uh, Mr Banks, you referred to this document again, and you referred to paragraph 36. Uh, For external, external audit, audit, yes. Sorry? For external audit. Yeah, so, yeah. You, so w w what's the element of paragraph 36 that you're referring to? Because it doesn't say here it should be referred to an audit committee. 
No, no. In terms of that reference was that to demonstrate that normally the practice is for external audit, it's post-event. So does it say that here? Must must review for seniors that such a review will normally take place after settlements have yes. been agreed. If the final settlements don't conform to the guidance in this document, so they should report the facts to the college in their management letter? Yes. So that actually happened? Yes, it did. Yeah. So is there any other parts of this document that you've ensured happens? Is there anything I mean, have you ensured that all parts of this document have been taken forward? As far as I, I, I think that I have in terms of taking forward both internal and external audit, although internal audit obviously was using bigger Bailey in that uh, process. Okay, can I thank you both for your evidence and uh, can I move the committee into the private session for five minutes?
Ladies and gentlemen, may I welcome our second panel of witnesses today, uh, who are Paul Brown, uh, the former partner of DWF LLP, uh, Bigger Bailey, and Alistair Peacock, the partner at DWF LLP. I can welcome you both uh, committee. You understand it will take for time this morning, but hopefully some of the issues can come out during the questions in respect of uh, what, what would replace an opening statement. So can I first of, ask, first of all ask you, Mr Brown, uh, just to confirm on what basis that you were appointed uh, as legal advisor to the uh, former Court Bridge College and, and who if appointed I, you. If I may just start for the benefit of the committee and just to explain the various names yep. that are bandied around. Um, I became a partner in Bigger Bailey in, back in 2000. In 2012, Bigger Bailey merged with DWF. For a while it traded as DWF, Bigger Bailey, the firm is Bigger Bailey. I left Bigger Bailey to join another firm in April of this year and obviously Mr Peacock still a representative of that firm. Um, <clears throat> the basis on which I became involved in this uh, was in October 2013. Uh, I received the call on around the 11th I think, of October it was from John Gray, uh, basically saying that they'd received a letter from the Funding Council and then the board needed advice on it and that I would be getting a call from John Gray, who was the chair of the board, and could I speak to him and help and assist and advise them on it? Okay, and that advice was that, I mean, the information we have from Mr Doyle is that you provided both legal and HR advice at the same time, is that correct? Essentially, what I, I, my background, just so clear, is I'm a, I'm a specialist employment lawyer, specialised in employment lawyer for 18 years. My involvement with the college historically had been ad hoc HR advice and equality and discrimination issues. That's the advice. The, we weren't, DWF weren't, or Bigger Bailey weren't as such lawyers beyond that remit. That was the only remit we had for the college. Okay. And during, so effectively you received the call from John Gray yeah. uh, on the 10th of October. So all of the information that you would have required to allow you to then provide advice to the remuneration committee and the, and the board, I take it as well. Who provided that advice? At any point, did Mr. Gray, sorry, Mr. Doyle provide that advice to you? The information, as either far informally, as either informally or, or, or formally. I, I didn't take advice or instructions at all from Mr. Doyle. Um, right. The information, as far as I can recall, may have come through his PA, but she was also the PA to Mr. Gray, and the actual administration function that was carried out by uh, Mr. So did you see it as your role uh, to ensure that both that information was objective uh, and you know, it was not information that has been purely provided to, to reach a certain conclusion? My instructions from Mr Gray, um, and he provided me obviously with a copy of the letter from uh, the Scottish Funding Council at the time, I think it was Mr Howells that had issued that letter, and that was on around the 10th of October. Uh, my instructions were to review the decision that had been made back in January and to advise the college on the legality of that decision and indeed what followed onwards in relation to payments that were being made to Mr Doyle and possibly other senior members. And, and during this proce process, did you see any evidence of collusion that, to reach a certain arrangement that, whereby Mr Doyle would enjoy? No, I did not. Enjoy? No. So you didn't see any... Uh, evidence of that? It, there was no evidence, or, and it was not apparent to me that there was any suggestion of collusion necessarily. No. So you've seen the official report from our discussions with the remuneration committee. Yes, sir. And one of the questions I put to them was, uh, did Paul Brown, who's yourself in terms of the legal advisor to, uh, to the remuneration committee, provide the guidance of the Scottish Funding Council guidance dated 2000, which is a significant document. It's one that gets discussed in all of our evidence sessions. It's the principles that should be set out. They advise us that that document wasn't put before them, they, that you didn't advise them on it. Is that, is that your recollection? I, I think, actually, to be, when reading Mr, Mr, the, what Mr Doyle has said, and indeed here this morning what Mr Banks has said, as I understand what Mr Banks is saying about my remit or my role was as reported to him by Mr Doyle. And my understanding of what Mr Doyle understand or suggests is that I was or Bigger Bailey, were brought in to advise the committee going forward, potentially, about their role and remit, etc., etc. That wasn't the case at all. I wasn't brought in in any way, shape or form to replace the auditors. 
and indeed I wouldn't have possibly been able to do so. Um, I was brought in to advise on a decision that had been taken back in January and th to essentially advise on the legality of that decision. Um, I wasn't an internal auditor. And so wh why, why do you think Mr Banks has referred to this? Because we found it pretty amusing as well and, and unusual. Well, as I understand it, what Mr Banks said is that was as reported to him by Mr Doyle. OK. So, but I suppose the, question, the real question I'm asking here, though, is this document's a significant document. So when you've researched this, which I take it you've done prior to being appointed yes. or after your appointment, first thing you're going to look at is what does the Scottish Fund the Council here going to provide a significant sum of money? I mean, it's, you know, talking about the above six-figure sums. Significant funds here. Would, should you not have referred to this document and said to the, to the Munition Committee, look, guys, this document's got a number of requirements placed in you. I need to make sure that I steer you through this. Did you, why did you my, my instruction, again, I think the other thing is Mr Doyle seems to suggest that Bigger Bailey were brought in. He didn't use the word auditor. Um, he used as clerk to the committee and advisory to the committee. That was not my role or remit at all. My role and remit was to consider the implications of the decision that they had made back in January and the legality of that decision they'd yeah, made back I in January. I understand that, but... It, it doesn't, you've not answered the question, Sorry. though. The question is, why didn't you provide a basic document in this discussion? That is the, the 2000 document, the, the year 2000, submitted by the Scottish Fund to Council. It's the very basis by which called you should operate. Why didn't you ensure that they were briefed on this and they had it before them when you were advising them? My understanding was that they all did have the documents before them. Well, they they were they aware didn't. of it. They said, well, really, as I, I actually, that, that we had all members of the Remuneration Committee before us, uh, as you'll see from the <coughs> official report, and we asked, I showed them the document, and all of them said, we've never seen that document. Nobody placed it before us. It, my understanding is that there, there seems to be some major confusion over timelines in this, and actually the problem is that the, the information and the investigation I was carrying out was in relation to, it was retrospective in relation to a decision that had been taken some time earlier. At, in October, I was provided with a bundle of documents, which I was informed at that time were, was information that was made available to the remuner remuneration committee back in January. Um, that included a copy of the SFC guidance. And did you brief them on it? Did you discuss it with them? I had mm. discussions with them about the guidance and indeed all of the obligations on them as members of committee on the decisions that they have taken and what they need to be cognizant of when taking those decisions. So what kind of issues did you, did you mention to them then? The, the, what kind of issues did you refer to when you... So, you know, is there some example you could set and say, yeah, when the Munition Committee were discussing this, I specifically advised them that this is what was required of them from the Scottish Funding Council in this document? One of the key issues, I think, here is that and what seems to be in debate was the payments that were made to Mr Doyle, as I understand it. Um, ultimately, throughout my investigation and into this matter and reviewing the documents and going over them with the individual members of the REMCOM and discussing their understanding and knowledge of these, at no point in time did any of that committee alter their view on the payments that were to be made to Mr Doyle. The discussion and debate actually surrounded the other members of the senior management team. But what they all confirmed and, and was satisfied me that they were aware of was that when they made the decision back in January, they were all clear that what they were making in relation to Mr Doyle was a commitment for those payments. So can I just ask finally, yeah. uh, you, you provided informal or all different kinds of advice to the college over that period from January. Uh, to, let's look at that period of January 2013 up until when Mr Doyle departed at the end of October. Did you have any informal discussions with Mr Doyle during that period about his severance arrangements? Or, no. or his, I mean, did they never say to you, well, it looks as if I'm you know, going to be getting out the door and you know, there's issues about my severance package? It's just never, it was never no, discussed. Just, just to be clear, I, I, the, the I, advice that I provided to the college was on a very ad hoc basis. Um, it was actually very rare for me to be in requiring to provide advice to them. As far as I can recall, I wasn't providing any advice to them between the periods of January. And just, just again to be clear, 
I was not involved in any way, shape or form no. in that decision in January. I, I totally understand that. And I, but I wasn't, nor was I in, involved in any advice. I had no discussions with Mr Doyle at any time about his arrangements or otherwise. So there was no level of any contact? I was, no, no level at all. Yeah. So, and it was just at that point when you were appointed. That, I mean, w was it done via correspondence, the, the appointment? Was, did Mr Gracie can we exchange uh, contracts of... Uh, who will carry out this process will you know, we'll we'll, we'll confirm in writing. Is that not what you would expect, though, to be, be some kind of exchange confirming on what terms that you would be? Not necessarily. Appointed. As long as the instructions were, to the lawyers were clear, then there wasn't, there wasn't, I don't have a concern. So only verbally? Orally, yes. I, I would have, in, in my firm, would have written a letter to them saying, uh, confirming the terms upon which we're engaged, but it's to advise in relation to the decisions taken by the remuneration committee in January. So, to, just finally, you can you can provide us with that exchange of correspondence that took place. I assume that must be in the college, uh, the file. Can I just sorry, just so the committee are clear. Obviously, I've left the firm. Yeah, I've been provided that. with the copies, of, but I haven't got a whole entire access to the file. I have been provided what I understand are the extra are the papers that are in okay. the file. But I, but I take it we can make a request to your firm to to provide the information exchange that took place where you clarified here's the terms of how we'll go forward with this and possibly the cost as well because I take it would be cost implications for the advice that you provided. That, that would be in our standard terms can, of engagement. Can you recall what the costs were? Not specifically, no. Yeah, in excess of, certainly in excess of £1,000 possibly, okay. more than that. Okay. Ms Scanlon. Um, can I just ask, we've obviously had evidence from the Remuneration Committee, uh, we've had written submissions and oral evidence, and uh, they were certainly uh, not aware of the SFC guidance. Some said they weren't aware that any guidance existed. We had six of them here, and others uh, said that they thought that what they were being asked to agree to, the very generous pay uh, severance payment to Mr Doyle, was in agreement uh, with uh, guidelines. Um, today we've heard from uh, Lorraine Gunn. Now, what she says was, uh, you know, people were a bit worried about their future and a bit uneasy about what was going on. So the meeting of the 28th of January, we've heard from the Remuneration Committee and the Director of Human Resources said that the letter to Mr Doyle, which is basically the reason we're all here, was a letter of comfort. Now, how did that letter of comfort in your view, become a legally binding document. Uh, that was not what it was set out. That was not the understanding of the committee. It was just, you know, with the merger being a bit on and off, it was a letter of comfort. This was what might happen should he not get a job in the new setup. So how does a letter of comfort become a legally binding document where a man is entitled to hundreds of thousands of pounds above the recommended guidelines? I don't recall the members of the committee mentioning it as a letter of comfort. It's um, in our evidence today from the from Gun, Human Resources I, yes, Director. I accept that. I'm, I'm not sure of the committee. My role, as it were, to advise them on the terms of the letter that they'd received from the Funding Council in October, and in light of that letter, to advise them on the decisions that they had made in January and whether they were legally binding. Ultimately, um, and as my report confirms in the letter, and the minutes of the meeting as ratified eventually by the REMCOM uh, confirmed that they all accepted that at that meeting they had agreed legally to provide Mr Doyle with an enhanced severance package in the terms that they discussed. So the letter from Mr Gray, which was written to Mr Doyle a day or a couple of days after the meeting on the 28th of January, that was the legally binding document which others thought was a letter of comfort. Well, I can't speak for anyone else. Well, and, you said and it was a legally binding document and the, had to pay the money. The agreement, indeed, the agreement that they had with, um, that the, the committee had agreed at that time, in my opinion, was legally binding. OK, can I ask which one of you wrote the advice in respect of the liability of board members um, dated December 2013? It's... Uh, DLA Piper, who took over from Bigger Bailey, 18th December 2013. Was it one or other of you who wrote? <coughs> we're, we're not members of that firm. As I understand it, they were advising the Scottish Funding Council. That, that's a completely different firm. The Scottish oh, Funding Council sought legal advice after the event. 
from a different firm. There's so many lawyers I, and I auditors and yeah. uh, accountants, and uh, you'll have to forgive us if we get no, a wee bit confused here. I think if there's a legal firm in Scotland that wasn't involved in Coatbridge <laughs> College, they really deserve a gold medal, my goodness, for keeping out of it. Well, um, the, so I, I can't really, well, it looks like we'll need to ask them. And can I sort of ask you general questions um, on this advice? Because as a, my daughter's an employment lawyer, and I dare say that what applies to one firm applies to another. Uh, yeah, she, she could apply for a job, yes, I'm sure. Um, can I just say, can I just say, um, uh, information was raised about insufficient and inadequate paperwork. Uh, concerns were raised about the lack of a business case. Uh, concerns were raised that there was uh, a lack of an audit trail. So apart from the very over-generous payments to Mr Doyle and all the uplifts that would take us all day to talk about the money that was handed out, apart from all that, the Auditor General's report is about the lack of a business case, the inadequate paperwork, etc. Did you at any time talk to in your uh, role as an employment lawyer, talk to Mr Doyle and say, look, you know, the payments are in order, but you really have to get your admin right in order to satisfy good governance guidelines. It wasn't my position to speak to Mr Doyle. I was advising the board and taking instructions well, from the board. Well, did you advise the board on that? Yes, I did. And that was indeed the very issue that I was required to look at. So I why were you advising them in this <clears throat> other firms, giving them the same advice? Were they paying two separate sets of lawyers for the same I, advice? I can't speak for the other firm, as I understand it were instructed by the Scottish Funding Council, not by, uh, not by Coatbridge College, as I understand it. I can't speak for that other okay. firm's advice. So you advised Coatbridge College that there should be a business case, they should be able to justify all of the payments that were well above the guidelines. So why did Coatbridge College ignore all the advice that you gave them? I was advising retrospectively. Now. What I was there to assess was whether or not they had done that historically. And I was provided with papers which included um, a business case, as it were. Oh, um, we've never seen a business case. <laughs> well, I, I, Maybe yeah, you I, could I, provide us with I, that. I, I'm happy to do so. Um, but I was so you came, with, sorry, you came sorry. in in October. Just to, if we can just get this, I think it's important, the timeline. You got a call from Mr Doyle in October about the 10th or the 11th. The auditors came in the following year, uh, April 2014. That was when we discovered that there was no business case, nothing to justify these over-generous payments. So what advice did you give Coatbridge College between when you came in and the auditors finding out the lack of evidence here? I, I can't speak for the auditors, nor indeed the Auditor General. There's so no one's asked me for right, this. You'd, you'd said earlier you'd received the call from Mr Gray, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so rather Mr Doyle. Doyle, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so just to clarify for I know, it's, it's also confusing. There's so many Johns as well. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I think the, the first call was John Doyle. The first call was John Doyle. Who said you would get a call from contact, John Gray. I, I will get a call from John Gray. And yeah. it was instructions were taken from John Gray as a chair of the board. Right. So John Doyle phoned you and he said, you're about to get a call from John Gray. Did he tell you what John Gray was likely to be calling you about? We have received a letter from the funding council. And, you will, and John Gray will be calling you to discuss it. So Mr Doyle said, we've got a letter from the Funding Council, we're in a bit of trouble here, they don't really like the payments that we're recommending, we need a bit of legal advice to help us out. Was that the lines of the phone call? No, that, that's not what he said at all. Okay. All he said to me, there was no reference to we're in trouble or otherwise. All okay. he said is that we'd received a letter from the Funding Council and that the, the board would need a, our advice on it and therefore Mr Gray would contact me to discuss that. Right, well, just my final question, convener. We've got so many people offering advice to Mr Doyle and the board and we've got Scott McCreef and all the rest, but apart from saying to the board that they really had to have a business case to justify what they were doing, did you give them any evidence about personal liability for the decisions that they were making? Did you give them you know, legal advice in terms of them acting as a, as a charity? And also, did you ensure <coughs> that the remuneration committee... Uh, I mean, we've been told that information was withheld from them. 
uh, we've been told that they made a decision on the basis of the information they had, which did not include the Scottish Funding Council, less than generous payments uh, that, that would have been paid out. There seems to be a case of withholding information here. That's in the Auditor General's report. Are you satisfied? Do you think the Auditor General's report is accurate in that sense? I can't comment on the Auditor General's report, and I wasn't asked to provide any information or otherwise to the Auditor General. What I can say, though, was the information I was provided at the time. I was provided with a pack of papers, which included a business case, included funding council guidance, included the letter that the college had received in October from the funding council, then Lawrence Howell. Um, I, it included email, an email exchange that had happened in January of that year between Mark Rathel of the Funding Council and the draft minutes of the REMCOM meeting, among other, among other documents. OK, can you just, <coughs> given that we don't have access to this business case that justified the £304,000 to uh, payment to Mr Doyle, can you give us a verbal account of the business case that was uh, used to justify that payment? The, the, the document, that, as I understand it, was presented, and I was informed was presented to the Remuneration Committee at that time, made reference to... Was that um, in January? Were they given a business case in January? Yes, and I think actually Mr Gilliver referred to that as being the 25th of January um, information that had been provided to them. And who provided that business case? Was it Mrs Gunn? I'm, I'm not sure, but my understanding is it was from... Uh, or, prepared by Mr Gray, but I couldn't say okay, it. OK, so certain. perhaps you can tell us why that business case justified the exceptionally high payments to Mr Doyle. Um, it wasn't for me to say why it justified the payment. No, I appreciate it's for the that, but if you could tell us that. what was contained in what it. What was contained within it was an explanation, general terms, and I'm happy to provide a copy, um, explained from, as I understand it, the uh, chair of the college, explaining the difficulties that there were with merger, etc., the sterling work that Mr... And I don't think that's the phrase that's necessarily in there. Please, I'm paraphrasing. Um, that Mr Doyle had done for the college and in order to ensure that the students, etc., of Coatbridge College were protected and the staff, that it would be beneficial to ensure that an arrangement was in place for <coughs> Mr Doyle to see that whole process through. That's my understanding of what the business case was. And does it give you concern that that business case mm. was not used as information and given to either the internal, the external auditor. We don't know about the due diligence or whatever part you played in the accounts, etc. It's all very confusing. But does it concern you that the, inf the business case for Mr Doyle's departure has not been seen by any of us or, as I understand it, Audit Scotland? I wasn't aware of any of that until the, I read no, the minutes I'm, of this I'm not meeting. asking if you're aware. I'm asking, does it concern you that the Scottish Parliament's Public Audit Committee and Audit Scotland, as I understand it, do not have a copy of that business case that was used to justify the 304,000 to Mr Doyle. It's not for me to provide an opinion on that. I think that's a matter for the, the committee to determine. Okay, Thank you. You said that there were three grounds in the business case. This is a business case that none of us have seen before. The Auditor General says doesn't exist. All our previous... Um, uh, witnesses have said didn't exist. I am flabbergasted that you have a business case. We don't. The Auditor General doesn't. No witness that we have had in front of us in the last month has said there's a business case. Well, I'm, what I'm telling you is that I was provided with a bundle of papers which included a document headed private and confidential members of the remuneration committee only in confidence. And it's from, as I understand that it, was John on the 28th Gray. of January 2013. It was, in, it was on, on or around the 25th of January, as I understand it. Yeah. Please bear in mind that I was provided all with this document I quite in understand. October. I quite understand. Um, but also, just so I'm clear and for the benefit of the committee, um, I was also provided, <coughs> I say, with other documentation. And sorry, just again, so I'm clear, I've mentioned three excerpts perhaps from yes. it they're, they're not they're, yes. they're only so do you think that actually uh, i mean your interpretation and correct me if i'm putting words into your mouth but your interpretation is you saw three grounds which could be considered to be a business case but some others like an auditor might say a business case would have numbers timelines explanations detail in other words and that would be what might normally particularly in the context of the funding council advice and guidance be considered to be a business case it may fair? be it may be that an auditor okay. would have a different opinion yeah, of what, sure. what amounted to okay. a business case yeah. um but again just and, and on the subject actually um 
Ms Scanlon mentioned is that, um, as I say, my advice was essentially retrospective. I was provided with information. As part of my investigation, I did speak to the members of the Remuneration Committee, and I wanted to be certain with them that they understood what their obligations were in terms of charitable and other organisations, and each of them were experienced members of committees, and they all assured me that they understood what that was and that uh, they, they knew what their obligations and responsibilities were. Okay. In the information I've been provided was indeed a copy of the guidance. In the minutes, there is reference to the Funding Council guidance. When I spoke to them, they all assured me that they were fully familiar with their obligations and all the information that they needed. I cannot comment any further on what they've said about whether or not they had this before. And I'm not asking you to. Um, the, the three grounds you mentioned, the, the, la the, the third ground, the third basis, sorry, for the business case was that Mr Doyle would see, I think in your words, the process through. Well, he didn't because the merger came to an end in February. But Mr Doyle didn't leave at that time and he no, remained indeed. with the college. No, but my, my <clears throat> suggestion to you is that the, the basis for his severance package agreed at the 28th of January 2013 on the, on the information you've given us today, which I'm sure is entirely right, is that he would, the Mr Doyle would see that process through. But that process did not, uh, was not seen through because it came to an end in January when he and his board withdrew from the merger process. I don't that think that's, a that, that's well. The understanding, my understanding, indeed, what Mr. Banks suggested this morning is that everything was void as at that time. Yeah. That's not the case at all in relation to Mr. Doyle. His the business case, as you'll see, that was nothing to do with assuming that 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 merger would go ahead at that particular point in time. And indeed, um, his the, there was debate. I think, as I understand it, again, please just uh, it's all retrospective about whether it was to be a federation or a merger. And then there were various, there was, I think, Colt Bridge were in and then they were out and then they went mm. back in. But that didn't alter, in my opinion, the decision that the remuneration commi committee had come to in January, which obliged them to provide Mr um, Doyle with this severance. Well, in that case, the business plan, if it does exist, didn't stack up at all. Because if one of the grounds for it was that he would see the process through and that's now not material to his severance package, then it can't be considered to be part of the business plan, can it? As I understand it, that was the decision they made at the time based on the decision plan at that time. Again, if I may, the, the, I still, my opinion was that, that there was still a contractual obligation on the college to provide that severance package to Mr Doyle and I confirmed that, my yeah. opinion, in October. Okay, and, and was that, is that contractual obligation because they had written the letter, the, the board had written that letter, or rather the remuneration committee had written that letter to Mr Doyle after the meeting on the 28th of January? Is that why that obligation existed? The decision had been taken, as I understand, by the remuneration committee, and that had been conveyed to Mr Doyle. So the advice that we got earlier on, that there was no financial liability, can't possibly be considered to be the case? Yeah, again, if I can just explain that, I mean, it's very confusing. I appreciate the timescale for everyone in the committee and, and perhaps some of the witnesses and independent bits of knowledge. Um, the advice in relation to the senior management team was different from the advice for the principal. And the minutes at that meeting and the meeting confirmed the arrangement would be for the principal. Uh, what there seemed to be some concern and confusion over was how that applied or whether that applied to other members of the senior management team. And in fact, ultimately, the debate arose around whether in fact it should apply to the whole of the staff of yeah. the college, not just simply Absolutely. the management team. Mm. Um, but in relation to Mr Doyle, that was applicable at that time and that was an obligation that was made at that time. The, the letters to the senior management team referred to, as I understand, being referred to as being dependent on the um, merger completing as at 31st July. Yeah. That's not what I understand from Mr Doyle. His was dependent on him just being there to continue to run the college until such time as the college no longer existed effectively. So there were different letters to, as I understand to, on it. one hand to Mr Doyle and on the other hand to senior members of the management team. As I understand team. it. Right, that's very helpful. And, and the advice actually just on that point that ultimately would be being void or otherwise. Yeah. That was advice I was able to provide to the remuneration committee on the board in October. Mm -hmm. Again, having examined all of the paperwork retrospectively and the fact that it was time limited in relation to the senior management team, I was able to reach that view 
I'm not aware of anyone, and I wasn't involved in any discussions at that time, I wasn't aware of anyone making that decision in February or no. otherwise. So, so in short, your advice in October when the remuneration committee met again, and bearing in mind you've clarified very helpfully, you weren't the auditor, you were just providing HR advice, that was the role you were asked to take forward by Mr Doyle. Your advice was that um, the binding agreement that they had entered into in uh, the 28th of January stood and therefore they just needed to get on with it and, and commit to it and pay it. My, yes, indeed. And, and as I say, I didn't just rubber stamp their no. decision. I examined all of the information that was available to me and the further information that I requested of them and indeed spoke with the members of the remuneration committee. There's been mention earlier on of um, the, the committees being paperless and I, the first meeting I was involved in was one in October. Um, and certainly they all had, as I recall, iPads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was issued with a set of papers, um, and, but the, the, the members of the committees had iPads, and my understanding is that all the papers relating to that, the committee meetings, whatever it be, were uploaded onto them. We'll probably go round and round in circles on who saw what and when, yes, and, and, and we'll get nowhere on that one. But, but just, sorry, just but to be clear, just to be clear, when I spoke with the members of the committee, yeah. and the remuneration committee, again, reviewing the paperwork and ensuring that the decision had been, in my opinion, taken legitimately and legally, uh, that, that I was satisfied that they were all aware of the obligations on them as members of the committee and what the obligation included being fully familiar with all the information. Were you satisfied that they also knew that Mark Batho had said, and this is your paper to us or your, pa or your submission to the committee, uh, that Mark Batho had said in his discussion with Mr Gray before that meeting in on, on, uh, late January 2013 that he, he would, and I quote, encourage you strongly to stay within these parameters for the voluntary severance arrangements? Um, as I understand it, what had been discussed with Mr. Bathel was relayed to the committee. The remuneration Did that come committee. up again in the, in the meeting in October, in the remuneration committee in October? No, the remuneration committee in October was focusing very much on the minute that was taken in January. Which was disputed, and, of course, wasn't it? Well, it, yes, it was disputed in some respects, but again, it was disputed not in respect of the Mr. Doyle. Yeah. There was no dispute about the, the arrangement for Mr. Doyle, just about the senior management team. Yeah, OK. Could just two, two final questions, if I may, convene it. The first, um, did you advise on confidentiality agreements? I, the, the, as I understand it, the college had a, a standard severance, a settlement agreement. Again, sorry, just again to be clear, um, I wasn't advising in January what I, well, if anything, I would have been advising in October in the terms of a settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. That's a severance, formal severance agreement. Mm -hmm. And there are, within that, there is a confidentiality Despite provision. the fact it's, it's incompatible with Scottish Funding Council advice and guidance. The, 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 uh, my understanding of the reason for it being in there was is to encourage people not to disclose it to others not that they shouldn't be disclosing it to those that are entitled to be aware of the information. That doesn't seem a policy that's worked very well, has it? But, uh, there we are. And, and, and did you have any discussions? Were you aware of the guidance as well from the Funding Council, given you, I appreciate you had to review a multitude of papers that said the internal auditor had to be involved in, the in any severance, uh, voluntary severance arrangements and proposals in that regard? The, the Funding Council guidance made reference to, and I think it was referred to, paragraph 36, the external auditor, which is post the event. And as I understand it, paragraph 35 talks about the internal auditor reviewing decisions. Ultimately, and I think as confirmed in my report, my um, having re requested this information, I was informed that the internal and external auditor has, had been informed. So who informed you of that? I, I can't recall at the Did moment. Did it be Mr Doyle, perhaps? Or no, it wouldn't be Mr Doyle, because I, I wasn't discussing, I wasn't taking advice or instructions from Mr Doyle. Was so it the Director of Finance? I, I don't recall speaking directly, but most, mostly my instructions either came from Mr Gray or Mr Keenan. And they, so they told you um, at some stage in October that the internal or the external or both auditors had or were involved in that process? As, that as my recollection was, I had been asking them to confirm that yeah. they had complied with the guidelines and, and the audit, audit were aware of this. And yeah. yes, certainly they were. That's what aware means. Is, yeah. Yeah. Again, again, sorry, just if I may, for the benefit of the committee, um, I think Mr Doyle made reference to the suggestion that um, Bigger Bailey, you know, we have, were cheering, yes. and, and not cheering, sorry, secretariat mm -hmm. to the meeting. 
Um, that, that's not correct. Uh, we were there, I was there in, a, in my capacity as a legal advisor. Um, and just to survey what had gone on, at the remuneration committee meeting, I was there very much providing advice. Yeah. But at the board surveying, my trainee at the time was there in a note-taking capacity because at that stage, uh, Lorraine Gunn was no longer there. No, to that's fine. That. I think that's very fair. Um, the, the, the question I, I forgot to ask about the business case, and I just wanted to conclude on this, is um, you, you have said there was a business case, and it was presented at, in the, on the 28th of January 2013 to the remuneration committee. But our, my understanding is that must have been presented orally. The, the, what, was there a paper? You've referred to a document or, or some paper that you're going to give to the committee. I was provided with a paper right. uh, of what I was informed that the, the committee were aware of when they made that decision. I, again, I say Paul Gillover referred to, I think there was another email somewhere from Tom Keenan where he referred to, um, this was sometime in October, his understanding of what the committee were yeah, Mr. Keenan wasn't at that meeting, as we know, so if no. his view, and frankly, it's neither here nor there in context of that meeting on the 28th of January. But it's just, to, to be absolutely clear, your understanding is there was a paper T tabled, maybe on their iPads, but tabled somehow at that meeting, which constituted, in your view, a business case. That was my understanding. Yeah. That's why I was impressed. Right. Thank you very much. Before bring Colin beat it, I, just, I think it would be helpful to the committee, just going back to the point where you said about the committee making you aware of the fact that they said that an external and internal auditor had been aware of these arrangements with Mr Doyle. You, say, you mentioned both Mr Keenan and Mr Gray. Now, just so it were clear for the record, is that, is that something that you would confirm once again? Because you're pretty vague about it and, and you know, you're a legal practitioner, so you know the position we're in. If we're going to prepare a report, then we need to be clear about that information that you provided. At the time when I was first instructed, which, as again I say, was about the 11th of October, um, there was a... Initial instructions were came from Mr Gray. There was then a transition arrangement, essentially, because by the board meeting, which I think was the 23rd of October, effectively Mr Gray was demitting office and Mr Keenan was taking over. So there was certainly an element of liaison with both of them. Um, yeah, but you understand the point, it's quite a significant statement to make, though, that both of them were, were made you aware or advised you that the external and internal auditors were aware of these arrangements. I really need you to confirm either you re withdraw the statement or you confirm that it's correct. I, I can't confirm which one of them or either of them said, all I know is that at, that, at, at the, when I was investigating the, this matter, someone informed me that indeed the internal and external auditors had been is informed. Is it something that would be email exchanges on? Is it something Not that I'm aware seen? of. Again, these are oral. The, the, it, it wasn't, it, I wasn't reviewing, again, that I wasn't reviewing the decision at, as at 23rd of October, I was reviewing the decision that had been made as at the 28th of January. I'm not suggesting that I was advised that prior to the meeting on 28th of January, that internal audit had already been made aware or approved that. I'm not aware of that. Um, but my understanding was that in reviewing pavement payments, which is what the guidance says, that the, the internal audit will review um, decisions that are made that at some point in time, internal audit and we're made aware of it. Right, okay. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the, audit, the, the remuneration committee met on the 28th of January. It didn't meet again until October. A letter was issued on the 29th, which was signed off, and which presumably is the one that you were involved in, uh, in scrutinising. No, just to be clear, I wasn't involved in that letter at all. I think, again, Ms Gunn, again, it's one of these confusions in time and involvement. Um, I was only involved in relation to a very brief advice on the settlement agreement, which was in October, on October. So did you not see the letter? No. Now, Lorraine Gunn and her evidence here, her, her written submission says that there were actually two letters issued, a further letter being issued. The first letter, it would appear, was assumed to have expired on the 31st July. A second letter was then issued, presumably from what I see here on the same terms, but it's not clear on what authority that second letter was issued because there was no remuneration committee meeting. I can't speak to that. I don't know anything about that. So that information wasn't shared with you at the I'm, time? I'm not quite sure which letter we are referring to. Well, this would appear to be the letters to the uh, senior staff. 
As I understand it, letters were issued to senior staff on or around the 7th of February, in which they were provided with, and this information was, or at least I was supplied with two of these letters, that they were issued on around the 7th of February, which more or less said that the remuneration committee had met, and these were the packages, and it was in assuming a merger as at 31st of July. When I was required to provide advice on that subject by October, and specifically speaking to Mr Keane and Mr Gray, Mr Gilliver, Ms McCarthy and others, um, my opinion was that those letters were not enforceable because they were time dependent on a specific date. My understanding is that Mr Dawes was not so. Now, given that these letters were allegedly reissued after the 31st July, on what basis would that have been done? Would it, be, would, it be, would, it be, would it be that they could hold the original remuneration committee decision as still valid? I'm, I'm not aware of these letters being reissued after 31st July. So that was never shared with you? No, no. no. I am aware that there were letters written by some members of the, I think, the senior management team into October, which purported to accept the decision that was made back yonder. No, this appears to be a separate thing. <coughs> now, perhaps Mr Peacock here might be able to comment. These letters, both, both sets, according to, according to Lorraine Gunn, were sent to the auditors. Have you seen copies of these, either of them? I, no, I haven't seen any of them. So these letters, so these letters, it's incorrect to say these letters were ever shared with you? My understanding of what um, Ms Gunn was saying was that as part of the due diligence exercise, and just to understand the due diligence exercise, the, I wouldn't call them auditors because they're not doing an audit, but the, the accountants who are usually the reporting accountants effectively will ask a whole range of questions about a whole range of subjects. And one of the typical questions would be, can you provide us with copies of any communications to the senior management people? So I would have, from the evidence I heard this morning, I would have assumed they would have uploaded to the due diligence site, which is basically just a pile of information, copies of the letters. I thought what she had said was that she had done that on a couple of occasions as opposed to there being two separate letters. Her written evidence here makes it rather clear. Oh, I haven't seen the written ed no, evidence. Just, sorry, just to be clear, I haven't seen the written evidence no. either. Now, apparently there was a merger management group meeting on the 7th of October 2013 at which auditors were present. And this information apparently was shared again at this meeting. Are you aware of that, Mr. Speaker? It would be, can I just clarify, I mean, if it's any benefit to the committee, Mr. Peacock wasn't involved in this process at all. Um, it was me that was providing the advice, essentially. Mr. Peacock, I think, in essence, is here as a representative of the firm, which I am no longer a partner in. So, and okay. I suspect he wouldn't necessarily be here other than that. <laughs> I, I, I've read through the file just to from the firm's perspective. The advice was given by the firm. The fact that it was Paul Person who gave that advice, the advice is given by the firm, so my firm is responsible okay. for that advice. So, Mr Brown, you were not part of the merger management group at all? No, not at all. Okay. In your um, report, which you gave to the college, you said you'd have been advised that this arrangement was approved by the college's internal and external auditors. Who advised you of that? Again, as I, I said to the convener, my understanding was that that was relayed to me by either probably Mr Gray or Mr Keenan, but I can't be absolutely certain who told me that. Mm. But it was included in Paul's report. So in the report, it says that that has been approved. You know, I've seen that report. And just, just, yeah, yeah, so everybody saw that. And nobody came back and said, hang on a minute, this is wrong, because that was one of the assumptions upon which Paul was reporting. And that, that's exactly right. And as lawyers, we are often advised, we're only able to provide information on what we're provided, advice on what the information we're provided and did we request, and the, the report was on that basis. No one ever came back to me to say that's wrong or otherwise, and indeed I think a letter of 12th November to Mr Keenan was in similar terms. I have to comment that you're, the way you describe this is a very, very narrow remit that you had it in, was terms, in terms of your involvement here which is completely at odds with what the college seems to be indicating. I, I, it may be at odds with what Mr Doyle seems to be indicating, um, but uh, my, my remit was very much to examine the decision that had been taken in January um, by the REMCOM 
and whether or not that was effectively legally binding on the College and effectively obliged them to provide a severance package to Mr Doyle in those terms, subsequent, and indeed the other members of the senior management team. On my advice, we were able to, the College was able to not be obliged to provide that advice, uh, sorry, the, those payments to the members of the senior management team, but Mr Doyle, it, they were obliged to and do just so. Just to pick up one thing here, your, your communication to the audit committee states, I did not take any instructions from Mr John Doyle. The finance director appeared to think that uh, that was who you were dealing with. Well, indeed, and, and I heard Mr Banks' evidence, and it certainly seems that what Mr Banks believed is was as reported to him by Mr Doyle. Um, but that is not the case. I wasn't instructed by Mr Doyle. Initial contact was made by Mr Doyle, but beyond that, all and any instructions I took were from the chair and the board. What makes you believe that Mr Doyle had uh, misled Mr Banks? I didn't say that Mr Doyle had misled Mr Banks. You I said that the information... Well, I'm not saying... I just that wonder if you had a basis there or I'm not saying that Mr Doyle that. misled... Uh, I'm not saying Mr Doyle misled Mr Banks. All I'm saying is that's my understanding of what Mr Banks has reported this morning. I, all I can tell you is what I knew my um, remit to be. And uh, that's, that was my remit. I have no understanding or otherwise of what Mr Doyle might have relayed to Mr Banks or how he relayed it. Okay. And next report is Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Um, Earlier on, uh, Mr. Brown, you mentioned that uh, when you were contacted, well, sort of when you received the, the, the documents, um, there were uh, four that you, that you did highlight. One was a business case, uh, an SFC guidance, SFC letter, and also the, an email exchange between Mark Plato and the, the, the Rimcom. Uh, but uh, you did mention that they were just some uh, of the, the papers that you received. Would you be in a position, or would uh, Mr Peacock be in a position, to actually provide the committee uh, with a list of all of that relevant documentation uh, that, uh, that yourselves had received at that particular time? Absolutely. Sorry, just rather than the list, you mean the actual documents, some copies of the documents themselves? Uh, well, yes, possibly, yes. if it may. I, I think yes. certainly. Well, I think it would be useful certainly to get a list, uh, because we, we actually may already have some of the documents. Uh, but, I mean, if you're prepared to provide all the documents, then uh, that would be very well, useful. I have authority to disclose documents, so uh, information and documents, so I'm quite happy to do so. Right, okay, thank you. Um, and in terms of the, so the evidence that we heard earlier on uh, from Mr Banks regarding the, uh, his opinion uh, that the decision that was taken on the 28th of January should have been uh, nullified, um, did you have any discussions uh, did you have any discussions with Mr Banks or anyone else regarding the meeting that took place in February, uh, which was the decision to, to come out of the merger process? Uh, and did you have any discussions with, with anyone or did you read, uh, did you see any paperwork uh, regarding any, uh, any, uh, anyone's opinion or thoughts that, that that decision then nullified the decisions that were taken on the 28th of January? Just to be clear, I wasn't involved in any negotiations or discussions as to whether or not the college was in or out of the merger at any point in time. Um, in October, I was provided with, I think, copies of the merger minutes that were taking place in, in October, in fact, and I think perhaps September. Um, but I wasn't involved in any discussion in February or otherwise about, and no suggestion about that being void. Ultimately, I provided advice to the remuneration committee um, which, in my opinion, uh, meant that the senior management team contracts uh, or letters uh, could be not necessarily void, but that they weren't binding because we could avoid the terms of them. Um, <clears throat> so did anyone from that particular committee uh, or the management team raise the issue with yourself that uh, the decision taken uh, could have potentially been void? Forgive me, which decision are you talking about? Uh, the, the decision, uh, well, from the opinion that Mr Banks mentioned uh, earlier on, that's a decision in February. Uh, I know obviously you weren't around at that point, but from when you, when you did uh, become involved, um, and also as yourselves were providing legal advice 
uh, to uh, certainly to the committee and to the management team. Um, uh, I mean, was the issue of that uh, uh, was the issue of the, the nullification or, or the, the voiding of the decision ever raised? Uh, because I mean, I would imagine that would be uh, if someone uh, like if someone actually had that opinion that uh, that, that potentially could have been void uh, in terms of the, the management decision. Sorry, the, the, the decision that was taken on the 28th of January. Then that would, there would have been some legal implications there. Sorry, just, just to be clear in relation to, I wasn't advising, I wasn't providing legal advice to the management team at such at that time, the board. Um, but no, I wasn't involved in or aware of any discussion that might have taken place in February or otherwise that suggested in any way, shape or form that right. those decisions were void. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, and just to be clear, uh, Chair, we haven't seen the severance letter, have we? We haven't seen the severance letter. So my question really is this. You, you've seen the severance letter. No, sir. So you've given a legal judgment on the basis of a severance letter that you haven't seen. Sir, yes. Because I wasn't aware of the severance letter at the time. The information that I was provided with didn't include a severance letter from Mr Doyle. It included obligations that, and indeed the instructions that I took and the information I received were based on decisions that had been taken by the board. I, I'm, I'm really confused. Yes, I'm really confused now because the letter on the 28th, 29th of January, which was sent by John Gray rather precipitously after a remuneration committee, the minutes of which had not been confirmed, and when was accepted, is that, that, is that not the document, in fact, which is the, the document which led you to say the remuneration committee, having made that decision, having made that offer, having had that offer accepted, must stand by it? Or are you simply saying the mere fact of making that offer, no matter what that offer contained, the mere fact of making that offer was sufficient? The decision had been made and was conveyed, as I understand it, to Mr Doyle by Mr Gray. Right. And therefore, and, but how do you that know that that severance letter didn't contain a time-related element in the same way as the senior management document, because or were the, you simply told that? I was informed of that. I was advised you that. Didn't, you didn't see the letter to check it? I wasn't advised that there was a letter, as far as I can recall. So, we have a severance letter, which is made on the basis of a merger, which then didn't take place, but you, which you were also informed included terms which said that that severance payment should include a cover for the seeing the merger through. Yet the merger was not seen through, and yet that severance letter was still, in your view, valid. The, the minute the board reports, the effectively report to the board for Mr Doyle was different because it wasn't based on a merger taking place necessarily on the 31st of July. One of the, the parameters for Mr Doyle was that, um, as I understand it, the, the, the wasn't necessarily envisaged as being a post for Mr Doyle going forward. He would have to... Um, but he would have to continue to, to manage the college and lead the college through that period whenever a merger might take place. As I understand it, now, forgive me if I'm, timelines are wrong, in, in January it was going ahead and then subsequently they withdrew from the merger. Correct. That's true. Um, and then they re-engaged with the merger. But his, his package wasn't dependent on the time. The time. No, no, I understand that. But his package, from what you've told us, and what we know included a requirement to see the merger through. The merger did not take place, as I understand it, until March, April 2014. <clears throat> Therefore, that part of the severance agreement uh, and the letter, which you've said is, you gave advice was, was, was valid, was never going to be fulfilled, was never actually fulfilled. So why would you suggest that that payment had to be made? In October... When I was advised on that, at that stage, by that stage, and by the time I was instructed, um, the proceedings were already in place, as I understand it, for Mr Doyle to leave. Because yes. I had been determined by that stage that he was going to leave. Yes. As I understand it, the reason why he was leaving at that stage, rather than 31st of March 2014, was that it was, and I use the word political with a small p, um, not appropriate for him to remain there in the long term or indeed see that transition through because of the relations that perhaps existed between him and 
other board, uh, sorry, other principals, etc. Yes. And therefore, at that time, and indeed prior to my instruction, at that time, the board had already determined, yes. again, and reiterated again, that the decision they would make was to allow Mr. Dodd to go with that package, and indeed, that instead of being required to work mm. until the 31st of March, because that was no longer appropriate, he would receive a payment in lieu of notice in respect of that. So that was a new decision, separate from the severance letter, which you haven't seen, which required him to see the process through, because that's the basis on which you said that they had to comply. So they, they, they made a separate set of decisions with regard to that payment. The decision to, um, to pay him or to make a redundancy payment or settlement agreement was made again back in January. It wasn't wholly dependent or solely dependent, I understand, on seeing it through. That was one of the parameters that, in the, the business case, as it were, said, it, you know, we, we, would, we need to encourage him. And I am very much paraphrasing. You can read the letter yourself. Um, but I, the, it, to see the process through, etc., etc. Mr Doyle remained um, as, a, as principal of the college throughout that period. And then there were... When, um, Cobridge College were then back into the fold, as it were. There were various joint meetings of principals and then merger committees, etc., etc. And so he was continuing in that regard. Then, by October, at the time when I was appointed, was it, the, 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 the committee at the board had already determined that it was no longer appropriate for Mr um, Doyle to be there. But that didn't nullify the agreement which they had in place, which was, you are seeing this through. And, and can I just clarify as well, that the advice that was being sought of me was the, the legality of the agreement that was taken and what perhaps would be the implications for that. Um, as I say, in relation to the senior management team, we were able to extract ourselves, or the college, sorry, I say ourselves, the college were able to extract themselves from those arrangements on, a, on my advice. In relation to Mr Doyle, the, the commitment had already been made and indeed negotiations. He was working his notice, and, as I understand it, at that stage. He was effectively on a timeline for going, and therefore there was a commitment to that. Um, and as, in my opinion, there was a commitment to that. They had to do that. Were they not to do that, then inevitably it would have led to legal proceedings and further cost, etc. I think the point is there's been significant reliance by Mr Doyle on that set of circumstances right up to virtually the week before he's going to go. And the whole point is, when you, when you, the whole point of paying somebody a, a package of some description is to keep them on board. That's why you do it quite far in advance, is to keep them on board and committed yeah. right through a period of time. Yeah. So to try and change that at the very last minute... I think, and it, these things are not absolute black and white, but what you would have is a claim against you and the whole cost and disturbance and all that goes with a claim which had a reasonable chance of success. Yes, I, I, mean, I, I still find it extraordinary that you were able to make a very clear decision without actually seeing the letter and the terms of those letter, that letter. I mean, can you absolutely guarantee that letter did not have a date in it at all or was that simply something you were told? I mean, you know very clearly that there was a date in relation to the senior management offers. Yep. But in relation to Mr Doyle, the basis for your opinion was that that was an undated element. In, in other words, it was related to a merger at some point, that these are the terms that would follow. So you're very clear that that severance letter, when, we, when and if we ever see it, will actually state clearly that this was the merger but didn't have the 31st July date so. or any other date in it. I can't comment on that because I haven't seen the letter. What I was advising on was the decision that had been taken by the remuneration committee, which was in January, that a, a settlement arrangement was going to be given to Mr Doyle. That agreement was taken at that stage. The, the governance arrangements for the remuneration committee um, were that the chair would then convey the outcome of those meetings. And the chair, as I was informed by the chair himself, um, conveyed that to Mr Doyle and confirmed that that arrangement had been put in place for him. Can you, I mean, this may be not a fair question to you, but can you understand why the senior management were made an offer with a date on it and Mr Doyle was made an offer which was undated? As I understand it, part of the, the rationale, as it were, was that inevitably it was unlikely that Mr Doyle would 
obtain a post in the new college. Whereas the others would. Whereas the others would. All right. Thank you. Richard has certainly clarified a number of points, and I was going to ask also just a very quick point. Uh, basically, we haven't seen any business case, we haven't seen any letter, you haven't seen a letter either, so I think that we really need to see that. But can you just say something in a couple of words? If Mr Doyle had not got this payoff package, bear in mind he's the only one that got it, would he have took the college to a tribunal? I can't speak for Mr Doyle. In, I your, in your opinion... But in my opinion... There was, a, there was a real risk to the college that if they did not pay what they had agreed to pay to Mr Doyle some t considerable time earlier... But you didn't see the letter the, that... So you, what, what, was you then in, that. what was then had been reiterated in negotiations that were taking place in October, even before I was instructed, what then had been confirmed as going to be the package to be given to Mr Doyle, as I understood it. If they had not followed through on that, I, yes, I believe there was a very real risk that Mr Doyle would have raised proceedings and there would have been difficulty for the college in those proceedings. Just a, wee quick, just a quick follow up. I mean, you've been given legal advice. You were asked to come in to give legal advice to the board. Was that legal advice pertaining to the fact that Mr Doyle did not get this settlement, then the college could be taken to a tribunal? The advice. Is that why you were taken there? No. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. The advice I was asked to provide was in relation to a decision, again, that had been taken in January. So I was effectively advising on, a, on an, a, a decision that had been taken back in January. In relation to Mr Doyle and the other members of yes. the senior management team, what would the effect be? How... So how did you know about... You were brought in and retrospectively for the letters which we've heard from others was letters of comfort and they weren't necessarily legally binding but Mr Doyle has got his pay but you were asked to come in specifically to advise on that specific uh, with the two different letters I presume because we haven't seen any of them how could you give advice when you have you didn't see what advice not in relation what information to Mr Doyle. did you give you get sorry at these meetings for you to give the advice of yes if it's not paid out the college could be taken to a tribunal. Just, just to be clear, I wasn't asked to provide advice in relation to Mr Doyle, because Mr Doyle, by but that you stage... you just said you were asked to give advice on the, the remuneration. On, on, on the remuneration, on the, on the decision that was taken previously. Yes, that's correct. By, by October, on. when I was instructed, Mr Doyle was already in receipt of a draft settlement agreement, which included the terms, because, as I understand it, by that stage it had been confirmed that he would be entitled to receive. He would receive the package and a who, settlement agreement. Who confirmed agreement. this then? You didn't see the letter? Mr, Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray address. confirmed the chair. Mr. Gray. I, that's who I was receiving instructions that. from. But, it, but, but nothing but, in writing, just verbally. But the, the, already there was, in writing, a draft settlement agreement. But which nobody confirmed saw this terms. draft settlement. Well, um... I think Ms Gunn would have done. Well, that's um, obviously the question I asked Ms Gunn previously, which she mentions in her evidence that being a letter, she drafted a letter on the 28th yeah. to the principal and senior staff, but she says it was looked upon as a letter of comfort. But I so think there, Ms, I, I, if, Ms Gunn give that evidence, or, she, or if she'd left by this time? Ms, Ms Gunn... You know, when you went to give sick. advice... I can't recall when she was off. She I mean, was off sick. She states here in the evidence to us that it was a letter of comfort and the staff did not consider the letter as an offer as such? Well, I, that's not entirely true as my understanding of the well, situation because, in fact, the, I wasn't involved at that time, just so we're clear. The, the, when I was involved at anything was, was when the settlement agreement was produced. So I wasn't involved in a letter, any letter that might have been drafted back in, in January. I and the, the confusion that. about the 24 hours and taking legal advice, there was no legal advice provided by me in relation to that in January. There was in relation to settlement agreement latterly, or well, sometime in October. So basically, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. But basically, you know, you were brought in by the board to give advice on these settlements from a phone call from Mr. Doyle to say that you'll be getting a phone call because the Scottish Funding Council were looking at this, and then you were drafted in then to give legal advice to the board. Is that a correct time scale? Essentially, of I was drafted in because by that stage they had received a letter from the Scottish Funding Council, um, and it made reference to the senior management team. It didn't actually specifically refer to the principal at all, um, and 
therefore they were concerned about what the terms of that letter and we needed to the, the committee asked me to look at the decision that they'd taken and you back. saw that you saw these letters which letters sorry the ones you just referred to the letter of 10th October from the Funding Council. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And that was, in, that was in the papers that were provided to me at the time. Did you never think of asking for the letters that were sent out by, um, you know, the to the remuneration committee or anything at all? Or I was provided with a bundle of papers that included some of the, re the letters Something. that were issued to the senior management team, but not the principal's letter. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to finish, Chair. I know there's lots of questions, but I just find it really strange that you know, an employment lawyer wouldn't even look at letters of remuneration and then give a decision. But I understand you were told, you can say no, or if, if you feel like it's the wrong way to put it, you were told that if Mr um, Doyle did not get this uh, settlement, he would take the college to an industrial tribunal. I wasn't told that at all. That was uh, your but opinion? Yes, but it would have been my understanding, yes. But your by the stage I was involved, uh, likelihood perhaps, but by the stage I was involved, Mr Doyle was already negotiating and, in, and yeah. had a draft settlement agreement. Again, I think the decision had been made back in January, yes. and that's the difficulty. I was, I was only looking and asked to provide advice on the decision that had been taken previously, and indeed in relation to the senior management team, because of the concerns that were raised by Lawrence Hills in October, mm -hmm. what impact it could have on them. And ultimately, I was able to advise that we could... We could ignore, well, not ignore them, but we could not have to rely on them. We could alter our opinion on them and not be complied to comply, uh, obliged to comply with them. But in relation to Mr. Doyle, very specifically, the package that he had been agreed had been agreed you by the board. You never saw this in writing. No, but but just so I'm clear, so. just so I'm clear that the, the the discussions that I had at that time, the instructions I received from the board, the Rem, what the Remcom, the oh. chair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and the, what, the advice I sought from them and the in further information I asked of them related to their understanding and knowledge at the time they made the decision. And the minutes record the fact that they have, no one had any question with the package that was being put together for Mr Doyle. They all ratified that and they were all happy to confirm that they accepted that that package would be put to Mr Doyle. That decision had been made back in January and my opinion, the, the college were obliged to comply with that. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Yes, it is still. Um, I'm grateful for all the evidence, and I, and I think we've actually got it all, but I'd like to go just go back and make sure I've got my timeline correct on this. My understanding was that you were instructed around October the 10th? They're 11th, yes. We're, we're not quite sure. Yes, okay. So, so it's all really in the next 10, 12 days after that that we're, we're, we're talking. Now, you've said several times, Mr. Brown, that you spoke to the members of the remuneration committee about their understanding. Was it during that period, or was it at the meeting on the 23rd? And was, was it ahead of the meeting on the 23rd, well, or was it what happened? I, I, I can't remember specific days, but yes, no. there was quite a bit of activity between the 11th and uh, the, of October and the 23rd of October. Right. And as I recall, I spoke with members of the committee. I couldn't be absolutely certain when it was, but the different members of the remuneration committee, and they confirmed that, as I, I highlighted to them, obviously their obligations in terms of Oscar and other such things, and they all confirmed that they were experienced committee members and they were aware of their obligations. Right. Um, were, were those telephone conversations? or did... No, I had meetings at the college. Right, so you actually went along and spoke to them individually? I spoke to some of them individually, I think, but uh, there were general meetings. I can't remember exactly who and what and when, but okay. I did have meetings with right. various members. You, you, you've, you've said the members. Do you believe that was all the members? I believe it was, but I can't recall exactly. If, no. I, I, I do recall particularly four members. I can't remember if the others were there. Um, I, I, I couldn't say for certain that every one of them was there at the time, but... My understanding overall was that they all understood what the okay. obligation was. Fine, thank you. Now, just the evidence that you and they would have had in front of you at the time, you were clearly asking them about what they thought happened on the 23rd of January, sorry, 28th of January, yeah. which, which I understand. You've indicated that you hadn't seen the exchange of letters on the 29th between the college and Mr Doyle, and therefore presumably no members of the committee were aware of that either? I, I can't speak for the committee. So, so it wasn't I, discussed? 
And just so I'm clear, as I, I can't recall having seen a letter from the principal. That wasn't disclosed to me as far as I can recall. And it's certainly not in the papers that, my, that were provided to me in my file. It's not there. So, so what you would have been discussing with the members was, as you've said, you, their understanding of what they had agreed at the meeting rather than any paperwork in between, which Correct. they'd no more seen than you have. Uh, and if I've understood it right, even the minutes of that meeting hadn't been available. Was that something that you discussed with them? Yes, yes, the minutes. And, and indeed, I think as Ms Gunn confirmed, um, the arrangements for governance um, are such, or at the college, were such that minutes of meetings were provided, as, I, as was relayed to me, in advance of a subsequent meeting of the committee yeah. where they were then approved. Mm -hmm. Now, the remuneration committee, again, as I was informed, didn't meet very often because it was really only dealing with senior members of staff. Um, and as I understand it, the, following the meeting in January, the te next meeting of that ultimately ended up being the 23rd of October, which I believe was called as a result of the letter from the Funding Council. Yes, okay. Um, can I then... You, you've mentioned that Mr Doyle was already negotiating a settlement agreement. It's the first time anybody said that to us, which is kind of interesting at the stage of the, of the conversations. Can you, can you give me some clues as to at what point in that period between the 10th and the 23rd of January, sorry, October, to when, when you were involved, that that became known to you? It may have been on or around the 10th or 11th of October. So you were talking to the members of the remuneration committee on the basis that you knew what they had discussed in January was being worked up as a document that Mr Doyle had? By the time I was speaking to the remuneration committee members, yes. That he had an agreement that was in effect um, and that I was discussing that with them, yeah. So that, that had made the exchange of letters on the 29th actually quite redundant in your opinion, which is perhaps explains why you're not so upset that you hadn't seen them, because actually Indeed. it had been overcome by the draft settlement agreement, which was already being discussed. Correct. That makes perfectly good sense. You've suggested throughout, and I think in writing, that you felt the decisions were made were not ultra vires, which implies that you felt they were intra vires. Were you at any stage asked to make any other comment as to whether they were wise or appropriate, or was it simply a matter of would, the, would they stand up... Uh, would, you, the, sorry, would, the, would the college be in trouble if they were not honoured? I was not asked to provide an opinion on the, the figures and the decisions that they made at that time. I was just asked to confirm whether or not they were effectively legal decisions that they were obliged to comply with. And are you still comfortable with the decision that you made? The advice provided? Yes. Yes. It wasn't my decision to decide whether or not the amounts or otherwise were reasonable. The, the advice I was providing was on the basis that the, it was the remuneration committee that determined those issues, and they should be aware of the guide, they were aware of the guidelines as I understood it. But that I wasn't I wasn't advising on the amount or otherwise. Thank you. Questions from Mary Something, Mary Scanlon. Yes, uh, the meeting on the 4th of November, uh, there's an Appendix 2 and Appendix 3 to that meeting. Appendix 2, 3.1, uh, refers to voluntary se severance arrangements for senior staff which were not available for other staff and exceeded greatly the maximum reimbursement available from the uh, Scottish Funding Council. Appendix 3, uh, legal advice from Paul Brown, Bigger Bailey. Uh, Paul said the head of the Funding Council's letter was a panic reaction. Sorry, Do you think the head of the Funding Council got it wrong? That's not my opinion to provide well, my Well, that is your opinion did. according to Appendix 3, legal advice from Paul Brown in the minutes of dra uh, draft rem minutes of remuneration committee of Coatbridge College, 4th November. Paul said the head of the Funding Council's uh, letter was a panic reaction. So you were really... In essence, Mike, the, at the time, again, bear in mind, retrospect of a decision taken on 28th of January, at that time my understanding was that, as is outlined in the guidance, there is an obligation on the committee to discuss matters, and it's in my report, to discuss matters with the Funding Council, which at that stage they did. The then Chief Executive was a Mark Batho, 
Um, as I understand it, and I think as has been confirmed today and discussed, these issues were discussed at the meeting, and that's what I was informed, these issues were discussed at the meeting on 28th, uh, where Mark Baffo had not said at any point in time, you can't make these payments. And indeed, as I understand it from Mr Lovells, I'm not sure that he ever said, you can't make these payments. It was essentially that we won't fund payments beyond a certain level. But again, my advice was in relation to the decisions that were taken in January and Mark Bathos' comments at that stage, confirming again that they were independent committees and they were entitled to make the decisions. Well, quite a significant audit trail, which I won't go over again today from Lawrence Howells throughout the month of October, the month before this meeting. Um, so if I can just go down a couple of paragraphs. There followed some discussion on an appropriate letter for staff Following the withdrawal of the aforementioned college voluntary service scheme, any new scheme would be in line with the previous arrangements applying to all three colleges. So at that time, uh, John Doyle had, had left. He had his letter of comfort with his uh, very generous payments from January. But at that point, you were then asked to draw up a letter uh, Paul confirmed the letter would bring any potential problems to a head, and it was agreed that Paul would advise if a, a letter was obtained. Uh, you were to draft a letter to the Funding Council and to all staff on the withdrawal of the voluntary severance scheme. That was after Mr Doyle had walked away with his 304,000. Can we get that information uh, from you? Can we get a copy of these sorry. letters? I'm sure there are copies available. Can I just again be clear? Again, the, the Funding Council, and Mr Lovells became involved, I, I, I don't exactly know when, but his letter was in, in October. Um, by that stage, there was a very different arrangement going on than existed back in January. Um, and I think all that happened subsequently was retrospectively looking what might have happened. Criticism that seemed to be levelled against the college at that stage was about not having arrangements which complied with Motherwell and Cumbernauld colleges, and they wanted a, a set arrangement across all three colleges. Ultimately, we achieved that, and I drafted letters which were effectively required to get the management team to not enforce or avoid or they confirm that they were not able to enforce the previous arrangements that had been made. But th that didn't alter Mr Doyle's position. Mr Doyle already had his position. Can you move on? Uh, Richard Simpson, briefly. Uh, clear because I'm still astounded that you didn't see the severance letter. But you are now clear because you saw the settlement agreement, the draft settlement agreement, is that correct? Yes. And you are clear that the draft settlement agreement actually followed accurately in detail, every element of the severance letter which you hadn't seen. That was the information. I, mean, I, I to be fair, I, I'm not aware of the numbers. I didn't fill in the numbers, etc. No. But as I understand it, yes, But the yes, terms indeed. as to what applied to what Correct. and what was for what purpose. Correct. The terms of what was applied and what was agreed right. were all contained within the settlement. So agreement. if we get the severance letter and the, and the, and the settlement that, uh, that was actually made and we find there's a substantial difference between those two, what would you feel about that? I mean, we must assume there isn't, but you've assumed there isn't. Well, I've assumed there isn't because, the, 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 as I understand it, the settlement agreement and the figures contained within it and the arrangements contained within it were in line with what had been agreed in January for yes. Mr Doyle. Yes. And indeed, the only variance, I think, was that he was then getting a payment in lieu of notice provision because he was being required to leave earlier than his yes. notice he, period. He was no longer getting a payment to see the thing through, he was getting a payment in lieu. So no, 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 not at all. It wasn't one or the other. No, no. But, but, but the, the arrangement existed. His settlement agreement existed regardless. What he wasn't being able to do at that stage was work out his notice period because, I'm paraphrasing, as reason. I understood it, as I understood it, people didn't really want him around at that stage. Yeah. But, but no, no, that's a very different payments. They're not either or. Okay, thank you. Okay, just asking, and finally, just two quick questions. Did you advise us earlier that, as far as you were concerned, you weren't responsible for producing minutes of any of these meetings that you attended? No, that's not that's not correct. I wasn't the clerk or the secretary to the board. At no okay. point in time was I required to do that role. 
And sorry, Mr. Doyle made reference to me having access to the intranet. Well, he, I, said, he said here, you, he, he said that Bigot Bailey, there was only a matter of days for Bigot Bailey to produce a set of draft minutes and circulate it to the remuneration committee. I would not have had any other locus in that. So this is him referring to uh, the 23rd, the meeting in the 23rd sorry, of October. Sorry, who said that? Sorry. Mr. Doyle. Oh, Mr. Attended. Doyle. So, I don't recall mentioning it was only a couple of days for draft minutes, but, but yes, we were there in, in capacity. I was there, this is the board meeting and the remuneration committee. Uh, remuneration committee? Yes, on the 23rd. Yeah. Uh, I was there in the capacity as, and to advise the remuneration committee. Um, at the board, I was in attendance. As I said, because Lorraine Gunn was off sick, I think, at the time, the John Gray had asked, would it be possible for DWF to provide someone to take the minutes, and indeed my trainee came along Sorry. and did that. Could you just ask finally, did it never occur to you, what, why were you called in? Because as far as I'm aware, there's no other colleges have made use of, a, a, of legal representation in the form that you've provided. So did it never occur to you, maybe Mr. Dow is bringing me in for cover? Never at all. I, I mean, I, it's, not, it's not for me to question why clients call me in. As I say, it was only Mr Doyle... No, not, not at the time I understand that and I respect that, but I'm talking about looking at it now in reflection. Uh, it, it doesn't look as if your advice was absolutely necessary, given that you were already there providing had ad hoc advice anyway. Uh, all of the other colleges have went about uh, these processes, as far as I'm aware. I don't know why you give advice to other colleges who, have in, who are in this similar position, and none of them have had to appoint specially a legal practitioner to, to, to go through this process. So, didn't you just feel it was a wee bit over the top? At Not some point? at all. I think the reason, and bear in mind it was Mr Gray that was appointed to me at that stage, the, the catalyst for that was the letter from the funding council. They all received stage. letters. Everybody received a letter. I'm not aware of that. All I know is that they had received a letter from the funding council which they were concerned about and they required to seek advice or they wished to seek advice in relation to the decisions that they'd taken and the legal impact of those decisions and how binding they were effectively. So just ask finally, uh, in terms of the information that you have been provided and you said it was provided on a number of occasions by Mr Doyle's PA, is that correct? I don't know about a number of occasions. I, can't, I cannot be specific at who actually sent the information. As I, as I recall, Mr Doyle's PA tended to act as a PA for Mr Gray as well. But, but did you not have situations where you said, look, I'm attending the committee, I need to get some information here, I need this, I need that. Who, who then provided you with that? Because I, I take it it didn't just appear. No, no, it didn't. Use, usually I think, I think that information would come again through Mr Dawes PA and indeed Mr Gray's PA, yeah. when there was information that I required. So where did you think Mr Doyle's PA received it from then? I don't know. I, I, uh, Mr Gray was the one that was instructing. I asked for information. When I asked for information, so, I was provided with it. So, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not asking you to play the detective, but you must have had some... You must have looked at this and thought, who's given me this information? And could it be as objective as it should be? And I should they be providing me this? I mean... Because some of this would have been information that was, to other people, possibly their advantage. So did that never occur to you? Did you never? When I, when I spoke to Mr Gray, I would check with him what information I received and discuss with what I received. But Overall, I was discussing with the REMCOM yeah. all of the information I'd received. So they were aware of what I was But to be fair, with. though, I think you would have known that Mr Gray certainly wasn't creating this information because he's... It's not a full-time job for him. He's the chair of the board. So, again, he's depending on information provided to him. So, did it never occur to you that possibly Mr Doyle could be providing information? Even though he's not meant to have been involved in the process at all. Well, it, it's not for me to question where I get the information from. As I was... I, I asked for certain information from time to time. So, what kind of information would you have asked for? I think there were possibly minutes of earlier meetings and merger meetings and other such things. If I asked for information... I, as far as I can recall, I was provided with it. I, it was not for me to question where this information came from. Mr Gray was aware of what information was being provided to me. And so if I was being misled or other, by others, I don't know that. I asked for information and it was provided. It's very difficult for lawyers. You've always got to rely on the information that's provided by clients. Mr Doyle was not my client. I wasn't requesting information from Mr Doyle. I was requesting it from Mr Gray. And subsequently and Mr Keenan from the board. So no, no but, one... But to be fair, though, and just I'll say this conclusion, to, to be fair, the process of you being appointed was because Mr Doyle said, 
I want no more to do with this. You know, I, need, I actually use the term here. I want to create clear blue, blue water between me and the committee. Now, we've been given advice that maybe he didn't have to go about this the way that he did. So he makes that statement to you. You then need to be clear. Mr Doyle isn't giving me any information because he needs to create this clear, clear blue water. And all I'm saying is, I can't see how Mr Doyle's PA could be providing information to you and somehow she can't then refer to Mr Doyle. I, I can't just find that quite difficult to... to well, I, I don't know, because my understanding was Mr Gray was the one that's providing the information yeah. via... It, it may have been that he shared the resource of Mr Doyle's PA, but the important thing was that the information was coming at request from Mr, uh, Mr. me to Mr Gray and or the REMCOM, uh, not Mr Doyle. If Mr Doyle had any influence on information which provided me, I certainly wasn't aware of it and it had nothing to do with me. The, as, I, as far as I was concerned, when I requested, if I requested or needed information, it was provided to me either orally or in written form okay. by members of the committee. OK, can I thank you both for your time uh, this morning and can move the committee just very, to a very brief interval to allow for the changeover of witnesses. Some, some order colleagues. Uh, may I now welcome our final witnesses today. Uh, can I welcome David Robb, the Chief Executive uh, uh, of uh, Oscar, and Laura Anderson, the Head of Enforcement Office of the uh, Scottish Charity Regulator. I understand that Mr uh, Robb would like to make a few opening words. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to expand on the written evidence we have submitted in support of your inquiry into this uh, very serious matter. Uh, members have had the opportunity to read the submission, so I just want to highlight two things by way of introduction. Uh, first, I should perhaps say something about the charity regulator's role in relation to colleges. Uh, we regulate almost 24,000 charities in Scotland. And for the majority of those charities, we are the principal and often the only regulator. But for some charities uh, on the register, we share the regulatory role with others, uh, such as the housing regulator or the, the care inspectorate. And in the case of colleges uh, and universities, we operate alongside the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, and in line with the Scottish regulator's strategic code of practice, uh, we seek to minimise the burden on colleges by trying not to duplicate reporting or monitoring activity. Uh, nonetheless, many colleges have charitable status, uh, and as is recognised in the guide for board members in the college sector, all charity trustees are bound by charity law. So they are therefore expected to fulfil their duties as trustees and act at all times in the best interests of the charity, protecting its assets and its reputation. And as we've set out in our written submission, we have a concern that the actions of some trustees of the former Coatbridge College may have fallen short of this standard. Uh, and we wished to advise the committee of the implications of charitable status on the conduct of trustees. So as the regulator charged with upholding public trust in charities, we've also been following the Public uh, Audit Committee's inquiry extremely closely and we have begun collecting evidence and making inquiries of our own. Uh, the information that is emerging, uh, a lot of it emerging very recently, uh, is forming an important part of our consideration, but we've not yet reached the point uh, where a decision about enforcement action can be made. 
Uh, and that brings me to the second point to make by way of introduction, and, and I've given notice to the, co the convener through the clerk of this. Um, in view of the ongoing nature of our investigation, there may be some questions where we can't be as fulsome in our answers as we would otherwise want to be, uh, but we trust the committee will understand that. Uh, and can I just thank you for advance notice of uh, that information, and I'm sure the committee and the questioning will take that uh, into consideration. Uh, can I just ask you, and, and by way of, and maybe you can elaborate on some of this, we, we've heard evidence from, uh, particularly from Mr Gray, uh, who's the uh, chair of the former Court Bridge College, uh, when referring to severance payments, severance payments that were made, that yes, we were able to uh, you know, afford these payments because there were surplus funds available in the college accounts. Now, I'm not asking you specifically to, to relate to this particular case, but can you advise us that in your experience in dealing with colleges that many of these surplus accounts would be accounts that have been able to be accrued as a result of, of the being registered, uh, registered as registered charities? I, I think in general terms, convener, that, that would be right. We wouldn't make a distinction between the, the resources generally available to the college um, to pursue its functions. We would regard, in our language, those as assets of the charity. And when they refer to, yeah, well, we've been involved in commercial activities, so you know, whatever we create as a result of these commercial activities, then it's really not there for public scrutiny, possibly. And I'm not saying that's what Mr Gray has actually said, but th there just seems to be this perception that perhaps these kind of activities are not subject to, to scrutiny uh, because they have them in a different fund as part of the college. So let's just pay out whatever we need to, whether it's to do with severance arrangements or whatever. And would you say you're concerned about that culture that appears to be there across the college sector? I, I, I think that, w that would be, in our view, a, a, a dangerous misunderstanding. As I say, we would regard um, the assets uh, in the college, whatever the subsidiary trading arrangements or whatever, uh, to be charitable assets. And, and we'd, we'd regard the trustees as having the same duty of care over them as, as, as its other assets. And in terms of, uh, in general terms, the governance arrangements that should be in place for whatever arrangements have reached in terms of severance. You will have noticed uh, the, to the May 2000 uh, guidance set out by the Scottish Funding Council, which is the principles by which yeah. they set themselves out as. Is this something that you would see should be absolutely the, the very basics of what should be expected? And if they don't meet those expectations, then how, how can people continue as, as charitable organisations or even be expected to, to not be subject to, to, to legal uh, recovery as a result of, of not following the guidance? We, we would place very heavy reliance on that guidance as being uh, the thing that trustees should have um, upper, uppermost in their minds so, when making those decisions. So can I just ask, finally then, without referring to any specifics, but let's be general, if there's an organisation such as the college who provide, uh, who are provided with very clear guidance from Scottish Funding Council and they don't follow through in that guidance, uh, is the option available to your organisation uh, to recover these funds? And who would these funds be recovered from? Would, would it be the individuals who have enjoyed the benefits of those decisions, or would it actually be the trustees who took the decision? Um, the, the, the recovery of funds in, in, in circumstances like, like this has, has been something we have had some difficulty with in the past. The, the, the powers open to us under, under our legislation are somewhat limited in that respect. Um, we are able to um, uh, initiate proceedings against trustees where we find there's been mismanagement or misconduct, um, but it's not, um, it's sometimes not available to us to recover the funds, much, much to our regret. But can you, whoever the PAE, so whoever, was, whoever benefited from the payments, the payments, i.e. a former employee, would it be possible for you to recover those funds directly? Laura, would it be a mechanism? No, not certainly not, not under our, our legislation. No. No. So, so not. So it's only the trustees who carried out the trustees of the former, or even the former trustees, that the, the, the funds could be recovered from. But that's not something that we could initiate under the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act. Okay, Mary Scanlon. 
Um, can I just uh, ask, I appreciate that you are uh, investigating, if that's the right word, you, you are certainly taking a very keen interest in, in the information that we have. Uh, I'm looking at some legal advice that was provided to the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, it does highlight payments made over the basic contractual entitlement, insufficient and inadequate um, paperwork. Um, uh, we've also heard about the withholding of information. Uh, there may, potential, may be the potential to raise a claim around negligence and omission. But I think really, and if you take into account uh, section 25 of the Auditor General's report, the summary of all the serious concerns raised by the Auditor General, um, I'm actually quite surprised that this advice, um, which talks about the enforcement by Oscar against board members, such action is likely only in exceptional cases. Uh, where there is uh, considerable financial mismanagement, uh, even then there's little or no precedence in this area, meaning any legal action would be a test case, uh, inevitably mean arguing over unsettled areas of law, high legal costs, and legal action may be an expensive empty victory. It doesn't paint a very good picture of the rigorous enforcement by Oscar and I say that as one of the members of this parliament who actually set up Oscar. I was on the Communities Committee in 2005 when we set it up. And I have to say, I was expecting a bit more. You're really dismissed, according to this legal advice, as uh, not quite toothless, but um, you know these guys can get away with it uh, because you're not very rigorous in your enforcement. Perhaps you could take advantage today and tell us where you have found mismanagement and misconduct in the public sector and where you have taken the action that we expected you to take in setting up the Scot Scotland's own charity regulator. Okay. The, um, the, the Act does give us uh, some powers. We, we would not... Um except that we are toothless, but the powers are limited. And, and the Act tends to bear on the actions of trustees um, and, and with a view to protecting uh, further risk to charity assets and, and reputations. So um, where we find misconduct, uh, including mismanagement, uh, we can act to disqualify uh, or suspend a trustee uh, so thus reducing the risk on the asset. But the, the powers um, given to us through the legislation to recover uh, sums are fairly limited, and that has been a source of frustration for us and, and for others. Um, so um, the Parliament's um, aspirations 10 years ago may, may not well have, uh, have been fully realised, and, and this is a relatively new jurisdiction. We do not have many legal test cases to rely on. Uh, we do find ourselves in a number of areas of our operation uh, breaking new legal ground, and it, and it may well be that in the fullness of time we discover we want to revisit those powers, but there are, there are some uh, limitations on them. Applied to the Court of Session to retrospectively disqualify trustees of a charity, notwithstanding the fact that the charity doesn't exist. Quite a few of the people making decisions, they're, they're now working elsewhere in the public sector. Yeah. Um, no, not, have you ever not, taken not that action no. No, in the haven't. 10 years of your existence? No. We haven't, and it may be helpful if I highlight that that power was not actually in the original version of the 2005 Act. It was an amendment that was made in 2010, I think it was, by the Public Services Reform Act, but we have not had occasion to use it to date. So, uh, if, if you want to tell me, if, my, if I'm not allowed to ask this question, I'm not quite sure. What can be done by the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, notwithstanding what's being done within this committee, to send out a signal that public funds are simply not there for you to help yourself to? and no business case, no justification, no audit trail, and you know, you've heard all the rest of the evidence. We can do what we can, but you know, what can you do in this instance 
to put that message out to Scotland, to say that taxpayers' money is being scrutinised. We know that some people are facing difficult times. We are doing our best not to have people walking away with two and three times the amount of money that they should walk away with. We are doing our bit. What, what can you do in this case to help to send out that message? I, I think you've, you've put your finger exactly on, on, on the point, and that's really what was motivating us to um, send evidence to your committee just to flag up that in addition to all the normal government's expectations around the public sector here, there is an extra uh, level of care expected because um, that college was a charity and the members of the Board of Management were charity trustees. And that sets a higher standard on those individuals. They are expected to exercise a duty of care that is uh, above the normal standard. Um, and we want to take opportunities like this um, and as we investigate what, what can be done to really remind uh, everyone who is a charity trustee and, and we don't make any distinction be between the, the kinds of charities we have on the register. Uh, the law binds and bears on them all in exactly the same way and, and we need to send no, out a very my, clear message. My final message. question, uh, you know, unless people like yourselves and the Public Audit Committee of this Parliament, unless we stand up and say this is unacceptable, this, is, this cannot happen, the Audit, Audit Scotland have done their bit, we are now doing ours. You are here as part of the legal statutory scrutiny mechanism for the spending of taxpayers' money and the management of charities in Scotland. You know, if these guys walk away with this, someone else says, oh, well, look at Coatbridge College, tried their best and nothing happened. So I ask you just finally, because I know time's getting short, what will you do to get that strong message out there that you cannot behave like this? Well, this, this is exactly what, what can you do? This, this is exactly what we're looking at. Um, we, yes, but I'm we, just we, asking what powers, you know, if you look, if you find exactly the same as what we're finding, if you find exactly the same as the Auditor General has found, what is the maximum that you can do in terms of getting that message out there to say that the behaviour and conduct is unacceptable? I, I, I think, if, if, Laura, if you could answer in, in the specific, but I'll maybe Finished. make a more general comment. If we conclude that there has indeed been misconduct in the running of this charity, as it was then, the only power that we have available is the power that we've highlighted in our written submission, which is a power to apply to the Court of Session to have those individuals um, treated as if they were, have been disqualified as charity trustees. And that would have the practical effect of um, disallowing them to be charity trustees again of any other charity. That is the only power that we would have in this situation, Mr Scanlon. Convener, have you used that power before? No, we haven't. And would you be willing to use that power should this case justify it on this occasion? If we conclude, after having heard all the evidence, that there is a case to answer of misconduct, then yes, we would be prepared to use that power and to apply to the court. First is, what's the principal financial advantage to a college of being a charity? Um, I, I believe there would be advantages in relation to rates r relief, um, possibly in access to some forms of funding. Uh, those would be the principal. Advantages. So, in other words, if they, if, they rem if, if you remove their charitable status, there would be a financial cost to that institution. They'd have to find those funds in other ways. That would be in fair broad, observation. In broad terms. Okay, yeah. thank you. And the second one question is just for a matter of fact and record. It would be useful if you could just say who the trustees of Coatbridge College were in 2013, just for the record. Please. The trustees would have been the entire board of management of the college. Um, I don't have their names to hand, sir, but the, um, their trustees annual report for their last period yeah. explains that their board of management were their governing body, and we and would consider them all to be charity trustees. Were, were there would have executive been... directors on that board as well as non-executive directors? It, it included the principal, certainly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just to maybe just semantics, but can you just confirm that at this point you are pursuing an investigation of Coatbridge College? 
We are certainly in the process of making inquiries and indeed the evidence that the committee is hearing here and now and will do so um, again next week, I understand, forms part of our inquiry. But have you, is it, are you actually just on the lead up to an investigation gathering information or is there actually a formal investigation in place? Gathering information is a very active part of a, an investigative process and that, that is exactly the situation we are in at the moment. The, the, the powers available to us retrospectively are slightly more limited than, than for an existing charity, but um, we are very actively pursuing mm -hmm. uh, concerns here. And how long do you anticipate this uh, investigative process will take? I think that rather depends on how much um, more evidence is heard, certainly by the committee, and how much more evidence um, becomes available to us at this time. I'm not, I'm not able to say exactly how long that would take. Um, went right out of my mind there. The, ch the enforcement area of Oscar, how many people work there? Uh, approximately 11, sir. 11? Yes. How many, for a better word, prosecutions or uh, effective uh, actions have you taken since, uh, was it 2005 or thereabouts? Would that be um, actions of our own making or actions where we've applied to the Court of Session? Well, both. Um, in terms of actions for the Court of Session, um, I can recall two specific actions. Um, Successful? Yes. Um, in terms of powers that we've used of our own volition, I couldn't recall an exact figure at this time, but I can certainly provide that information to the committee at a later date. I'm, I'm just curious to see the, the depth of experience of and, uh, and, and, and past history there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, have I got... It's the Richard Simpson, sorry. Uh, I'm interested to know, not specifically on the college because of your doing an investigation, but... Uh, would you expect, um, a, would a business plan be a, a, a critical factor in determining whether the trustees have acted responsibly or not? In other words, would you expect to see a very detailed business plan leading to the provision of monies to effectively one of the trustees? Uh, would you expect to see a, a really detailed business plan, I mean, more detailed than a company or, or, or indeed another public sector body doing this if they weren't charitable? Yeah. Is, are there anything yeah. additional for the charitable point of view? I would certainly expect to see a very detailed business case, um, particularly when amounts of um, the magnitude that we're talking about here are being discussed, um, because charity trustees have a duty, a legal duty, to act with appropriate care and diligence, and that's a very high threshold that, of duty of care that's placed upon them. And would it be even higher because it was going to a trustee themselves? I mean, this payment was to one of the trustees. The principal was a trustee. I think in terms of the, the care and diligence that trustees need to exercise, I think that would have dictated that it should have a very, very high duty of care and therefore particular care should be taken um, over that business case and prudence exercised when making that decision. And have you had any similar cases in the public sector? For example, you know, we have some discussion about universities and the principals receiving significant uh, reward, as presumably they are trustees. Have you had any cases of that sort from anywhere else in the public sector where you've had to scrutinize business cases? Or you've been asked to? Or you've, you've, you've intervened to, to say, I want to look at it? Not something, not something I would say that's comparable to the situation that we're dealing with here, no. Right, that's not the, just quite the answer I'm looking yeah, for. I, I, a, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not has it happened? I mean, is, are there any other public sector bodies where you know there have been severance or whether it's going to lead to dissolution of the charity or people are leaving or trustees are leaving and they've been rewarded we, from the funds yeah. in that institution. The, 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 there was a case that, that springs to mind. It wasn't in, in a university, and to my knowledge, we've not had to look at any of those situations, mm -hmm. but there was a, a public body, a, a regeneration agency, where a, a departing um, senior official, perhaps not a, a trustee... He wasn't a trustee, no. Um, ..but um, a, an enhanced um, severance Seven, package yeah. was, was made there. We investigated yes. and found misconduct. Um, I'm not, I don't recall whether a business case was part of our 
investigations I, I, or not. I can't but, recall it was some okay. time ago. Let me just phrase the final question, that is, if a trustee is receiving a severance payment from a charity, are they required to report that to you? And if not, should they be? Um, they would be required to report it in the course of their normal monitoring, in the no course of the normal monitoring arrangements that we have. So you would get that in their end of year report or their we annual would. report? However, in this situation, it was obviously then in a wind up situation. Yes. And so the monitoring information that would have highlighted that didn't then come to us because the body had essentially been removed from the Scottish Charity Register by that time. So is that a flaw? That even if I'm in a charity and I'm a trustee and we're winding up, we should really still have to produce the final report, should we not? Are you saying that these, when a charity is dissolved, their last year they could misbehave as much as they like and unless Audit Scotland happened to find it or this committee happened to find it by chance, they could get away with it? There, there are also duties that exist on auditors of charities um, by Section 46 of our Act that require them to report to us where there are matters of concern right. and where there are matters that may be considered to be materially significant for the exercise of Oscar's functions. Um, so that is a duty that exists on, on all auditors and indeed independent examiners of all charities. But we know, or we're being told, that the, the severance payments that were made by the Remuneration Committee were entirely <coughs> intra vires and therefore an auditor would not necessarily report that unless, as the Auditor General found out, or the Auditor Process found out, there was some process within that that was wrong. But if the decision was valid, even if it was a massive payment that got rid of the final funds, of the, it would not be reported to you. I'm trying to understand, I, I hope you see where I'm coming yeah. from, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand, you know, are you being reported to appropriately on, on, on severance payments to those trust to trustees. I think I think in the wind up situation that we're talking about, um, it wasn't um, a normal wind up situation with respect because the the body itself was entering into a merger with no, other with bodies, yeah. Yeah. Um, and therefore there they think there was a more proportionate information requirement that we had of that charity. Um, which wouldn't necessarily be the same if we were dealing with a body that was simply being removed from the register and we didn't know, or um, not that we didn't know, but we had more questions about how those charitable assets would be used and how they would be moved. In this case, we were being told that the charitable assets were being moved to another charity, i.e. New College Lanarkshire. Okay. And, uh, there are powers in our act to uh, retrospectively look at charities. We have a sort of a duty of care when something has come off the register mm -hmm. just to be able to look back and make sure that things have wound up appropriately and that charitable assets haven't disappeared. Yes. As Laura's explained, that's not exactly what happened here, but no. we do have some ability to look yes. retrospectively. And, and could I mention that we are um, working on a, a, a toughening up of uh, notifiable events which we will expect charities to bring to us and we can well, certainly that's consider this. Welcome. be interested to see the draft on that. Thank you. Nigel Don. Hello, can I just pick up on, on the observation that Paul Brown made that he felt that the, what the remuneration committee had come up with was not ultra vires and therefore is intra vires. Uh, he was presumably thinking as widely as he, as he could, but it seemed to me that he was talking in the context of funding council rules. Did it concern you as you heard him say that that maybe he wasn't thinking in the context of charities? I would hesitate to, to comment on, on what Mr. Brown was thinking at that stage. Um, the comment that I, I would offer that may be helpful to the committee is that um, although it may have been within their powers to make the payment, um, I expect all charity trustees to really think about whether such payments would be actively in the interests of that charity, mm -hmm. because that is one of their legal duties under charity law. And in that context then, could or can you suggest any reason why a, an enhanced payment might be in the interests of a charity? In terms of the situation we have in front of us, um, there obviously is still being evidence presented. Um, I think it would be fair to say that some of the evidence that the committee has heard today has been somewhat conflicting, um, both with the, the witnesses that have, have been seen today and with also previous witnesses, and some of it is rather confusing. Um, I'm not clear 
as to exactly what case um, could legitimately have been made at this stage? Yeah, I, forgive me, I'm, I, I under, actually agree with that and I'm trying actually to stand back from this particular case, though clearly that's what we're addressing and look at the generality because I'm still struggling to find anybody who can tell me why an enhanced agreement might be reasonable anyway and even if somebody could give me a reason why an enhanced agreement might be reasonable, I'm wondering whether that could actually be the case for a charity. Uh, are you able, from your experience, ignoring this particular case perhaps for the sake of the legalities of it, are you able to give me any reason at all why an enhanced payment might be appropriate in the context of a charity? I think the only thing I'm, I could perhaps venture um, might be if there was some sort of personality clash essentially and it might be thought detrimental um, to the body moving forward for that individual to stay in post and in terms of acting in the best interest of the charity it might be thought best that that individual be removed from the organisation at an earlier date rather than a later date. That's the only thing I, I can possibly offer and indeed I can't say whether that would be no, it, appropriate in this situation. No, I, I'm not asking for comment on this individual case but if, if, if I take that point then surely how long somebody was getting to be paid in lieu of notice might be relevant in any calculation. And if somebody was going to get paid quite a lot in lieu of notice, then that might be difficult to justify. Would that be fair? I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Yeah, thank you. Brief final question from Stuart McMillan. <coughs> thank you, Convener. Um, are there any additional powers that you think would be very useful for yourselves uh, to obtain uh, in order to, uh, going forward, uh, to really uh, deal with situations that arise, uh, whether it's uh, something, something along uh, these lines or uh, with previous examples of things that you have managed to uh, address but not the way that you, that, uh, you actually wanted to do so. Uh, I, I, I'm tempted to ask how long, you, how long have you got, but um, we, <laughs> we, we, we are regularly um, pushing up against the frontiers of, of, of what's possible and we are in, in, in regular dialogue with our policy um, colleagues in, in, in the Scottish Government about um, uh, tweaking parts of the Act which may not work properly or indeed um, bringing in new powers entirely. One, one we, we did look at in the wake of the uh, example I gave before about the enhanced severance payment was where it might be possible in specific circumstances to give us a positive power of direction. At the moment we have uh, powers to direct charities and, and their trustees not to do things. In certain limited circumstances it may be possible for us to give a positive power to direct uh, a repayment of a, of, a, of a sum of money for example. <coughs> We're not, we're not quite sure how that would be achieved legally, but it is something we've been um, pursuing. Can I thank the panel for their contribution uh, this afternoon? And uh, thank you for time. Uh, colleagues, before we move into uh, private session, I would just like to draw members' attention to the letter of the 12th of November, which is in the minutes of the, and the agenda provided today uh, from the Scottish Funding Council, responding to the points that were raised our evidence session on the 28th of October. Uh, can I just draw colleagues' attention to the very last page of the response that we received from the Scottish Funding Council? And, and colleagues will recall uh, during the session uh, we asked for details of all college voluntary service schemes which exceeded the SFC guidance, details of the number of individual payments that exceeded the SFC guidance and the business cases provided for each of those voluntary service packages. Now, colleagues have seen the response uh, that, that they've received. Can I just advise that I find the response unacceptable? Uh, yeah. when, and can I just remind Mr Howells, uh, and for the record, uh, then when we seek uh, specific information, which I was very specific in requesting, and he agreed uh, to provide uh, during the public session, then we expect that information to be provided to the committee. So can I say to the committee, the information that we require should be uh, that we get the severance arrangements for all of those principals who were part of a severance arrangement as a result of the college mergers, uh, and as well as providing also at the same time the business cases for each one of those individuals, and also uh, for it to be provided in the format that the Auditor General provided yeah. for Coatbridge College, yeah. which confirmed the sources of funding that fund, uh, the, the sources of funding that was provided to fund those particular packages. 
and I expect uh, that information to be provided within days uh, and not weeks because this is in response to a request on the 28th. And can I remind also the Scottish Funding Council that if they fail to provide this information, which I think should be basic information, it should be provided for public record, yes. then we may ask them to report back to the committee in person and provide evidence of why they can't provide uh, that further evidence. Uh, it's very important that the committee is given an opportunity to properly scrutinise all of the information that's been put to us as a result of the Section 22 report, and to do that properly, the Scottish Fund the Council need to take seriously the requests that are made to them. I just wonder if colleagues want to add to that, or if colleagues agree with that way forward. Okay, so just to clarify for the record, we've got the unanimous uh, support from yeah. all members present uh, that we seek that information and it be provided within days. And I report back to the committee, hopefully, or indeed we should receive that, and therefore there won't be a requirement to report back to the committee on that basis. Okay, as agreed, colleagues, we have agreed to move into private session and move to agenda item number three. Thank you.